أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها وجعل فيها سرجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما والذين يقولون ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا ومقاما والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى أثاما يضاعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما ومن تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متابا والذين لا يشهدون الزور وإذا مروا باللغو مروا كراما والذين إذا ذكروا بآيات ربهم لم يخروا عليها لم يخروا عليها صما وعميانا والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذريتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقون ويلقون فيها تحية وسلاما خالدين فيها حسنت مستقرا ومقاما قل ما يعبأ بكم ربي لولا دعاؤكم فقد كذبتم فسوف يكون لزاما الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعث الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا My beloved brothers and sisters, honestly, it's an absolute pleasure to be sitting here uh, in this masjid and it's really, really pleasing to see all of these brothers and sisters coming on the Monday afternoon when, mo when normally a lot of people are working and they're busy. As you guys heard, some people, they called in sick. I hope he's sick, inshallah ta'ala, right? And he didn't actually pull, you know? May Allah Azza wa bless every single one of you guys. So to get straight into it, my brothers, my sisters. Today we want to go through five leading legal maxims that will honestly change your ibadah for the better. Honestly, it's truly amazing to go through these five leading legal maxims as it will really better our understanding of so many issues that we come across or that come to light in this 21st century. It will make things meaning it will put it into perspective 
right? You will have rules that you can keep on falling back on whenever a contemporary issue comes to light, right? These leading legal maxims, my brothers and my sisters, the way they came about, and this is a very, very important methodology that we can, uh, inshallah ta'ala, maybe perhaps take from this particular point that I'm going to make mention of. They were extrapolated from none other than the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As our brother earlier mentioned, he said one of the leading legal maxims is Al-Umuru Bimaqasidiha Right, where actions are determined by their intentions. And this has been extrapolated. It has been derived from a hadith that everyone here has memorized. Right, actions are judged according to their intentions. So this rule or this principle, this leading legal maxim, was taken from this hadith. Right? And so many different situations right, were applied just because of this rule that was extrapolated from this hadith, right? And what makes it a leading legal maxim? This is a key word here, leading legal maxim, leading. Because there are other legal maxims that are not leading. I'll tell you guys why. Because so many scenarios come under it, right? So many scenarios, so many situations would come under these leading legal maxims. So you have this principle that has been derived and extrapolated from this hadith, right? And then a contemporary issue comes to light. How do we apply this leading legal maxim to this contemporary issue that has come to light? Because there is a common feature, or in mathematical terms, common denominator, right? In that, we find a common feature. It is found there, it is also found here. And because of that, this leading legal maxim can also be applied to the situation. And when we now mention examples, inshallah ta'ala, it will become a lot more clear what we are saying. I may have lost you guys. Don't worry, inshallah ta'ala. Whenever I teach usul al-fiqh or al-qawaid al-fiqhiyya, I don't just like to mention the theory side of things. Even students of knowledge in Al-Medina, one of their most scariest topics is Usul Fiqh, right? Because it can get very, very technical. It can get very, very technical. But like I said, I'm going to be filling it with examples, right? That which is contemporary, that which is practical, that which everyone here, inshallah ta'ala, can relate to. So these lines of poetry that I'm going to be quoting uh, are from the poem of Uthman ibn Sanad. He has this poem where he goes through leading legal maxims and then he mentions another 40 legal maxims after that. We're only going to be taking the five and the first couple of lines of poetry, inshallah ta'ala, uh, in the session today. And for those who came in late, as I mentioned time and time again, this is actually a lesson. Right? You may think to yourself after coming to this lesson, studying knowledge may not necessarily be for me. I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that or feeling like that. Right? So the poet, he says, قَالَ النَّظِمُ رَحِمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَلَا تُزِلْ بِشَكِّ مَا تُيُقِّنَا مَشَقَّةٌ تَجْلِبُ تَيْسِيرًا لَنَا ولا تزل ضرر بضرر وحكم العادة بالتقرر إن الأمور هن بالمقاصد وخذ لأربعين من قواعد Five leading legal maxims that he mentions very very quickly اليقين لا يزول بالشك If something has been established with certainty it is not removed due to some doubt that has come to light I'll say that again اليقين لا يزول بالشك If something has been established with certainty it is not to be removed or dismissed due to some doubt that has come to light. That's the first one. Second one is al mashaqqatu tajribu taysir, right? Due to some hardship that has come to light, the Sharia, the Sharia, makes things easy or it facilitates ease. 
due to this hardship in the situation that one finds himself in. The Sharia is not here to make things difficult for us, providing, of course, the conditions are met. The third one, my brothers and my sisters, the elimination of harm. Elimination of harm. How the Sharia came to, right? Eliminate harm. Right? That's the third. We will elaborate on it, inshallah ta'ala. Number four, العادة محكمة Norms are authoritative. Do you guys know what norms are? Norms, right? Traditional practices are authoritative. By the way, Islam did not come to remove people's norms and traditions. Islam is not against our norms and traditions, guys. I think there's a misconception, especially among students of knowledge. When they go seek knowledge, they come back, the first thing they want to do is take people's norms and traditions away. Islam is not against norms and traditions. As long as, of course, it doesn't go against the Sharia. We'll come on to that, inshallah ta'ala. And then the fifth one is what? Al-umuru bi maqasidiha. Matters are determined by their intentions. Right? You killed someone. Like what was his intention when he was carrying this shotgun, for example? Was it because he was going hunting? And then he accidentally ended up killing someone. Can you see now how we determine through this principle whether it is murder or manslaughter? Intentions come in extremely, extremely handy. As you guys mentioned earlier, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ niyat. So the first one that we're going to be taking, inshallah ta'ala, is when uh, the scholars, they mention, الْيَقِينُ لَا يَزُولُ بِالشَّكْ That which has been established with certainty is not to be removed due to some doubt that has come to light. So you have this leading legal maxim that has been extrapolated from where? The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Where has it been extrapolated from? The hadith of when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِذَا وَجَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي بَطْنِهِ شَيْئًا فَأَشْكَلْ عَلَيْهِ أَخَرَجَ مِنْهُ شَيْءٌ أَمْ لَا فَلَا يَخْرُجَنَّ مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ حَتَّى Pay attention, my brothers and sisters, right? The Messenger Sallallahu said, if one now begins to feel a disturbance in his stomach, right? And then he doubts, have I lost my wudu or not? This guy went into the bathroom, he made wudu, walked into the masjid just as we walked into the masjid. You guys with me? And then the shaitan starts whispering, you probably lost your wudu. Because of this feeling that he feels inside of his stomach. Sahih? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, فَلَا يَخْرُجَنَّ مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ صَوْتًا أَوْ يَجِلَ رِيحًا He should not exit from the salah or he shouldn't leave the masjid up until he hears himself passing air or he smells something. Let me ask you guys a question. What has been established with certainty after this individual made wudu? What has been established with certainty? That he made wudu. He went into the bathroom. We also am going into the bathroom. He made wudu. Is this certain or is this doubtful? That's him going into the toilet and making. Certain. We all saw him doing it, right? He made wudu from top to bottom. And then now there's doubt that has come to light. Have I lost my wudu? Have I not? Is this a common question that people tend to ask? People tend to ask all the time. Sahih. What did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? He should not exit from the salah until he has what? A sound or a smell? A sound and a smell. Is this something that is certain or is it doubtful? Certain. What does the principle or the leading legal maxim state? If something has been established with certainty, it is not to be removed due to some doubt that has come to light. Right? Up until we hear something with certainty like the sound or the smell, he should not leave from the salah. He should not exit from the masjid. Right? So this leading legal maxim has been extrapolated from a hadith like this. So then my brothers and my sisters, when we have a contemporary issue, you identify as to whether there is a common feature also here. Right? We will come on to some of these contemporary issues, inshallah ta'ala. Also, we have another hadith where we can extrapolate a similar meaning. The Messenger said, إِذَا شَكَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي صلاته 
فلم يدري كم صلى ثلاثا ام اربعا فليطرح الشك وليبني على ما استيقن if one of my brothers and my sisters is inside of his prayer and he's doubting now as to whether he has done three or four right he should not right or should i say he should get rid of that which is doubtful and stick to what is certain what is certain here that he's prayed how many three we are doubting whether he's done the fourth or not agreed so here the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying get rid of your doubt go with that which you are certain with and continue your prayer this is another example right this is another example also the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us about the month of ramadan right fa in ughmi alaykum faqduru lahu 30 it's the month of Ramadan. We've just been fasting day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way up until the 29th day. And then we're doubting as to whether Ramadan has finished or not. What is it that has been established with certainty up until the 29th day of Ramadan? Is it still Ramadan or has Ramadan finished? So that which has been established with certainty is that it is still Ramadan until proven otherwise. Does that make sense? So due to some doubt, we don't allow that to override that which has been established with certainty. Right? This is why the Messenger Sallallahu said, فَأَكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ ثلاثين. If your vision is being blocked by clouds or by whatever else it might be, this is now giving you doubt as to whether Ramadan has finished or not. The Messenger Sallallahu said, stick with that which is certain. It's still Ramadan and complete 30 days of Ramadan. Right? And there are many examples, my brothers and my sisters, from the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where you could say this qa'ida, this leading legal maxim can be extrapolated from. Does that make sense? So now let's go into some tatbiqat fiqhiyya lil qa'ida. Some other examples that this leading legal maxim can be applied to. Even though there isn't a hadith that says if this happens, then you do this. No. Because we have this leading legal maxim that has been extrapolated from all of these other hadith, like I said, we identify the common feature. Or in mathematical terms, huh, common denominator. Do we have any mathemat mathematicians here? Fractions. You guys know how to common denominator and then you... Huh? Let's take some of these examples, inshallah, that we can maybe apply it to. And I'm sure you guys will enjoy hearing them. Making takfir of people. Do you guys hear about people calling this guy kafir and that guy kafir? Is it common here in Ottawa, the capital of Canada? Huh? Is it common? Do you guys hear about this? Like, someone has become a Muslim. He took his shahada in the message. Let's say he took his shahada in this message. Does anyone doubt now that he has entered into Islam? Right? We can only judge from that which is apparent, sah? Sahih? We can only judge from that which is apparent. He took his shahad and we deal with him as a Muslim. A couple of years go by, some people are spreading these doubts about him as to whether he's still a Muslim or not. He done this, wallahi, there's a high possibility that he may have lost his Islam. What is that which is certain here? Huh? He took his shahad that he's still a Muslim until proven otherwise until we have that which is certain which will override that which was previously established with certainty anything that is doubtful does not remove the certainty that has been established does that make sense imam shawkani rahmatullahi alayhi says i'lam he said no and al hukm ala rajuli bi khurujihi min al islam wa dukhulihi ila al kufr لا ينبغي لمسلم يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر أن يقدم عليه إلا ببرهان أوضح من شمس النهار. He says, passing a judgment or a ruling that someone has left Islam and become a kafir, right? It's not appropriate for any Muslim that believes in Allah in the last day to carry out unless he has clear cut proof that is more clear than daylight. Does anyone doubt that there is daylight outside? Is it dark, guys? Is it nighttime? 
Huh? I don't know. Maybe you guys are seeing someone else. Is it daytime? Is it dark? Is it nighttime? Does anyone doubt it here? This is clear for everyone to see. Alisa Kadalik? Bale. Clear for everyone to see. He's saying, you cannot declare another individual to be a kafir unless you have that which is more clear than daylight. Even if there's still, what, a 5% chance. I'll go a step further. There's still 1% chance that he's a Muslim, a 99% chance that he's become a kafir. That 1%, my brothers and my sisters, right, is what prevents him from being declared a disbeliever. It has to be clear as daylight. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? Because the asal here is what? What is the base origin here? That he's still a Muslim until proven otherwise. Did I mention a hadith under this point right now? When speaking about declaring another individual to be a kafir. Did I mention a hadith? No, I didn't. I mentioned the statement of a scholar. The reason why I'm saying this is, we don't have a hadith, but we apply that leading legal maxim, sah? Why do we apply it? Because we have a common feature. We have a common denominator, which is that which has been established with certainty is not to be removed due to some doubt that has come to light. Is everyone with me now? How we see these leading legal maxims being applied? No. Yeah. Shall after this, we're going to leave questions to the end. Yeah? Tada. No, tada. No, go on. Go on. Okay. So this issue of a takfir, calling another person a kafir, my brothers and my sisters, right, is a very, very dangerous, right, arena. Very, very dangerous arena. Very dangerous. On my YouTube channel, I went through an hour and a half speaking about the conditions of takfir, the preventative factors of a takfir, and how this is not for everyone, right? That you can't just run around thinking that so-and-so is a kafir, but in reality is not, right? So it's something that a lot of us here, my brothers and my sisters, should not be going forth and engaging in, if that makes sense, right? There are conditions, there are preventative factors. It's not for everyone. Right? We should, inshallah ta'ala, a lot of us here be more focused on fixing ourselves and becoming better Muslims. Yeah? Inshallah ta'ala. So did everyone get this example now? And how we apply these leading legal maxims. Another important statement that I think is worth reading is what Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned. He said, المسلمين. He said, it's not appropriate for a Muslim to do takfir, to declare another person to be a kafir. Right? وَإِنْ أَخْطَأَ وَغَلِطَ حَتَّى تُقَامَ عَلَيْهِ الْحُجَّةِ Even if that individual does it out of mistake, or he errs, until you establish the proofs. Do we believe that someone can act upon something that is disbelief? Yes, of course. People are leaving the religion of Islam all the time. صح? Someone can actually leave the fold of Islam. However, here, Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, you can't declare another person to be a kafir until you establish the proofs. You have to make it clear to him. Don't just rush to saying, so-and-so is a kafir. Akhi, the guy doesn't even know. That which he's doing takes him out of the fold of Islam. Does that make sense? وَتُبَيِّنَ لَهُ الْمَحَجَّةِ وَمَنْ ثَبَتِ إِيمَانُهُ بِيَقِينٍ لَمْ يَزُلْ ذَلِكَ عَنُهُ بِالشَّكِّ بَلْ لَا يَزُلْ إِلَّا بَعْدِ إِقَامَةِ الْحُجَّةِ Anyone whose iman has been established with certainty is to not be removed due to some doubt that has come to light. It has to be done with certainty. And this is only done after you make it clear to that individual, after you establish the proofs, after you clarify to that individual, Ya Akhi, that which you are doing is actually what? Something that takes you out of the fold of Islam. I'll give you guys an example, right? We have a lot of feminists today. Sahih? Inshallah ta'ala. We'll discuss a bit of that later on, in the second program today. There are some aspects of feminism which calls to the reformation of Islam. This Islam that we have today is not fit for today's day and age. What do you guys think of that statement? Huh? He said it's wrong. But what kind of wrong is it? Is it minor sin? Is it major sin? Is it a statement that takes you onto the border of Islam? Huh? You are flirting with disbelief. Borderline Islam for making that statement, saying that Islam is not fit for this time. However, a lot of these girls, 
they don't even know what they're actually uttering. They have no idea whatsoever. Am I correct to say that? They are just an echo chamber regurgitating information that they heard from their professor. Wallahi al-Azim. Right? I'm going to read out a message that I received. This is from a sister that attended one of the programs, I believe it was in Calgary. Right? This is what, he, this is what she said, right? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Inshallah, you're doing well. I was in one of your lectures today, the MSA program and also the Akram Jum'a. This is in Calgary, right? This is coming from someone who used to have a very liberalized feminist mindset. She's saying this. I'm just quoting. Your talk was truly amazing, mashallah. I'm low-key, sometimes scared and hesitant about these events, but you taught with such kindness and truth completely from the scripture, which I found really enlightening, alhamdulillah. Something I wanted to share with you today in 2019, that same hall where you gave your lecture at UOFC, I was taking sociology class. And the professor, who was a feminist, was talking about housewives and saying they are basically prostitutes. The professor at the university is referring to a housewife as this. This is when I started to see the cracks and hypocrisy in feminism, subhanAllah. Thank you for showing us that everything has flaws and controversies except that which came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My point is, this is what they are breeding in universities. They are convinced that everything should be looked at through the lens of equal rights. Sah? Miskina doesn't know. This innocent sister who's gone to university, she doesn't know, so she picks up some of these sentiments and she starts spewing it. A lot of the time when I speak to these sisters and they come to my programs, they walk away thinking to themselves, you know what? We don't even need feminism. Islam gives us our rights. Why do we even need these modern day ideologies? Right? I speak a lot about the status of a woman in Islam. And then they're wondering, subhanAllah. I was like, sister, because you haven't studied your religion, you think that you can maybe what acquire or attain justice elsewhere. Does that make sense? And sometimes it's scary what's coming out of their mouths. Like for example, they might say, this is unfair. A verse in the Quran, she's referring to it as unfair. Or it is oppressive. Hi, jama'ah, ma hukma hadi al-kalima? It's a problem, right? Poor the line Islam and Allah says, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Allah does not oppress anyone. And you're coming saying that Allah is actually oppressive. Even though she direct, she didn't word it like that exactly, but this is what your statement entails, right? But she doesn't know. So you have to explain to them the ins and the outs of what their kalima entails and the ramifications of that. It's not right to just say straight away you are a kafirah. No! We're living in very problematic testing times. Agreed? Where we are being bombarded with doubts from every direction. Especially in universities. That's why I'm really looking forward to our program next. Al-Qurtubi rahmatullahi alayhi says, Babu takfir, babun khatir. Aqdam alayhi kathiru min nasi fasakatu. Calling someone else a kafir is very dangerous, he says. Many people, they applied it and then they dropped. وَتَوَقَّفَ فِيهِ الْفُحُولِ فَسَلِيمُ And smart and intelligent individuals, they held back from it and they became saved. Good. Next example, my brothers and my sisters. What's your name, Akhi? Farhan. I lent Farhan some money, 200 Canadian dollars. And I brought forth the witnesses. Everyone here is a witness to me borrowing 200 dollars to Farhan. And he said, you need to pay me back five years down the line. Five years, huh? A couple of years go by, and then Farhan is doubting as to whether he has paid back the debt or not. Huh. Does the debt still stand, or should we just خلاص, يعني, forget about it? And I'm saying to him, bro, you haven't. And he's saying, I'm sure I did. At the gas station, when I came back to Ottawa, hmm? I'm sure I did. This is when we ran into one another. He may have gave me a bit of change. 
because I asked him for some change, but did he actually full on pay you back? And he's doubting. There's a possibility. Yeah, there's... And he goes, I'm 90% sure that I paid you. Uh, what's the yaqeen here? What is it that has been established with certainty? Huh? The fact that he hasn't paid, right? This is the asal. This is the base origin. It's been established with certainty that I gave him that $200. And then he's doubting if I paid it back, have I not? The leading legal maxim, that which has been established with certainty, is not to be removed due to some doubt that has come to light. Are you guys with me? What do you, what do you think of the example? Relevant? Um, I want you guys to really write down the examples because when explaining this leading legal maxim to another, with the examples, it begins to make a lot of sense. I've been collecting these examples for years. Another something, my brothers and my sisters, calling another person an innovator. This is common, right? I'm sure this is common. He's a mubtadi'a. He's an innovator. Don't go to him. Sahih? I see some of you guys smirking. Huh? Someone has been preaching the sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the default position, that he was what? Spreading the sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he was calling to the Quran and the sunnah upon the understanding of the companions, the tabi'in, wa atba'u tabi'in. This is something that we should all be doing, right? Quran, sunnah, not my understanding, not your understanding, but the understanding of the three golden generations. This is how we practice al-Islam. While we, at the same time, we, pra we respect our a'imma, the four great Imams of Fiqh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Malik, Ahmed, and the rest of them. But we're talking about how we practice Islam. So this was the asal, this was the origin. And then all of a sudden they start spreading doubts about this individual that he's no longer upon the sunnah. Huh? What is the asal here? What's the base origin? That he's still upon the sunnah unless... We have something certainty, something with certainty that overrides this. Agreed? Very, very common. Very common. You go to places like Medina and some young people are engaging in this. Right? Throwing people off. Right? Calling them innovators. Saying that he's not upon the sunnah. Imam Ahmad would say, ikhraju shakhsi min sunnati shadid. To take someone out of the fold of the sunnah, this is something that is very, very severe. You guys with me? Be very, very careful, my brothers and my sisters, especially at the beginning stages of seeking knowledge. Remain tight-lipped. Keep it zipped. You ripping into others may well be the reason why you stop seeking knowledge altogether. This is from the deception of Iblis. Sometimes even sisters get caught up in this. You go to a marriage meeting and she's saying, oh, are you, are you still upon the sunnah? In the marriage meeting. Oh, because you're listening to this sheikh, then you are off to me, or you are dead to me. Mushkila. Hmm? Mushkila. So what is the principle? al yaqeen la yizulu bishak. If someone being upon the sunnah has been established with certainty, it is not to be removed from him up until we find that which is certain, right? Clear cut. We're not giving out sweets here, brothers and sisters. It's not that easy. Right? Tayyib. <sighs> we attended the nikah of brother Farhan. Farhan, you married? Planning to get married? Inshallah. If you're not planning the sign wrong. Huh? Our brother Farhan, his big day arrives. We all go and attend and we witness this beautiful day where Farhan ties the knot. We've all witnessed him now getting married. Nikah is what? Yaqeen now. He fulfilled all of the conditions, the pillars, got married. Sahih? May Allah allow you to get married. Say Ameen. Have you found someone? Have you found someone? Inshallah. It's on camera, huh? My get. We attended the Nikah, he got married. Couple of days go by and his newly wedded wife is getting under his skin. She's driving him crazy. And they're shouting at one another, shouting at one another. And then he calls me, Farhan, he says, right? I don't know whether I dropped a talaq on her. And then I speak to her, she goes, Wallahi, I'm not sure this, that. 
What is it that has been established with certainty? By the way, this is a common question. Right? Arguments, shaitan gets in between them and then they're doubting, are we still married or not? I'm asking a sister, has he said, Anti Taliq, you are divorced? She goes, Wallah, I'm not sure. And he's having doubts as well. What do we do here, guys? Huh? They are still married. Al Yaqeenu, la yizulu bishak. That which has been established with certainty is not to be removed due to some doubt that has come to light. Agreed? Inshallah, Farhan, you won't find yourself in that position. Okay? Is that clear, guys? Taib, you're fasting in the month of Ramadan and then you're doubting has the sun set or not? Has Maghrib kicked in or not? You've been fasting for the last how many hours you guys fast? Maybe 16 hours? 16 hours. You've been fasting for the last 16 hours. And then you're doubting as to whether the sun has set or not. Right? What is the asal here? Huh? That you're still fasting until proven otherwise. Does that make sense? Because you know, there's always that period where you're doubting, has the sun set or not, you know? It's still a bit of daylight. You're going to have to wait until you establish with certainty that it's no longer daytime. Again, it's one of those common questions. The guy is in a rush. Huh? However, he doesn't have a time in front of him. Maybe gone out to the desert or to the wilderness. Am I Juzak? Hold on to your fast until proven otherwise. Let's flip the scenario a bit. Nighttime. Are you fasting in the nighttime? Is anyone here fasting in the nighttime? Maybe, I don't know. Huh? Some bid'ah that someone's doing. Huh? Does anyone fast in the nighttime? He breaks in the day and then he fasts in the night. Of course, there's something called wisal where you continue. Well, that? That's something else. I'm talking about he breaks in the day and then he fasts in the night. I don't think anyone does that. So, in the night time, he's not fasting. Sahih. And then he's doubting, has the day started or not? Has Fajr kicked in or not? What's the asr? What's the base origin here? He's not fasting, right? So until it is established with certainty that it's no longer night time, he can continue eating. Everyone get that scenario? Yaqeenu la yizul bishak. Knowledge is sweet, guys, right? It's nice, huh? Ah? This is why, guys, we need to seek knowledge. Huh? We can't just keep up with microwave knowledge. Huh? I know there's going to be a lot of people coming to the program today because they know me off TikTok. I don't even have a TikTok account. But this is how they come across the videos and they're going to be attending. And we want to just maybe what stick to these TikTok videos. Guys, this is not how you attain knowledge. These are sound bites that might scare the living daylight out of you when you're maybe doing something that is haram and gets you to maybe remember Allah Azza wa Jal. But it's not something that you can stick with long term. Does that make sense? Another example that which relates to suckling, breastfeeding. Right? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, كَانَ فِي مَا أُنزِلَ right? مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ عَشْرُ رَضَعَاتٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ يُحَرِّمٍ there was a verse that came down that's no longer in the Quran. It is mansukh. It's been abrogated and it's no longer in the Quran. It came down before. That if a child is suckled by, is that what they call it, right? Breastfed, huh? Breastfed. Ten times by a lady, then khalas. He becomes haram upon her. Does that make sense? Meaning he can't get married to her and so on and so forth. As if she breastfeeds him ten times. Nusikhna bi khamsin ma'lumat. However, it was abrogated and then the hukum, the ruling, became five. You'll see this today. You've got two sisters that are friends with one another. Sometimes their children are together, right? May well be that the sister has to go for hajj and then the other sister is actually taking care of a child. So here. And then she begins to breastfeed her because the baby is out of control. He needs to be breastfed. Right? So they end up what breastfeeding him and it becomes five times and khalas becomes haram upon her. However, now they're doubting. Did I do four? Did I do five? Which one do we go off with? 
And that's because we are certain with it, right? That's because we are certain with it. Let me ask you this question, right? Let's just say that there is a lady walking outside. We'll call her Maryam. And we have Farhan. Farhan is not married. So, eh? Sorry, Farhan, to keep using you. Right? Is Maryam and Farhan halal for one another? No, no, they halal for one another. Was there a nikah? There was no nikah. We're not talking about the scenario before. This is not. We're talking about Farhan and Maryam. Are he just seen for the first time walking on the road? Are they halal for one another? They're not. Of course they're not. There's no... Uh... The asal is that men and women, they're not halal for one another until... Until what? A nikah is established. Until a nikah is done between them, until they tie the knot. So the nikah has a certainty that removes this, right? Uh, these two individuals not being together or being haram for one another. No. So Farhan decided to go for Maryam. And he asked Maryam, who is your wali? She said, my wali is going to be my uncle. What's the first thing you should be asking? By the way, wali is the guardian. Because the sister cannot get married unless she has permission from who? The wali, right? Any woman who gets married without the permission of her wali, then her nikah is invalid, her nikah is invalid, her nikah is invalid. The Prophet said it three times. No nikah is valid unless we have two witnesses. So there are conditions and pillars that need to be met. The wali, generally speaking, should be who? Her father. She says to him, that my uncle is going to be the wali. What's the first thing that Farhan should be asking? Where is your father, Ahsantum? She turns around to him and she says, oh, my dad's a kafir. Wallah, I had dealt with cases like that. And then he doesn't do any research, gets the nikah done. There was even a scenario, subhanAllah, where a brother was telling me, right? He was abroad, he went to seek knowledge abroad. And he had a similar situation like this. She called her dad a kafir. And if he's a non-Muslim, is he allowed to be the wali? No. He can't take that position of the wali. What happened? He just gets a phone call out of the blue. He thinks that the father is not even a Muslim, right? She calls him and she says, please help me. I need some emotional support. Then what happened? My dad's knocking on the door and he's shouting, Fear Allah. Hold on a moment. I thought the guy was an Muslim. Right? He was completely thrown off. She's begging for emotional support. Huh? He's gone in a completely different world. He's thinking about the validity of my nikah. Is our nikah even sah? Because we needed the permission of the father. While she's like upstairs, you know, crying. My dad's about to break into the house. Right? And he didn't live with them. He was, you know, she was saying he was kafir. He left and whatever have you. And now he's telling her, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. So what is the base ruling here? What is the asal? That you are not married unless we have that which is established with certainty. Was this nikah done with certainty and properly? So then nikah is doubtful, right? This nikah is doubtful. What is it that we had with certainty? That they are haram for one another. Farhan is not halal for Maryam. This is the origin. Does that make sense, guys? Did everyone get that? So we always have to go off with that which is certain. Unless we have something else that is certain that overrides the first certainty. Did everyone get that? Any issues with anything that I said today? Under this first point? Are you sure, guys? Hmm. Yeah, if, the, if there's no... According to the majority, I know there's a Hanafi position as well. Huh? According to the majority of scholars, the hadith that I mentioned, any woman who gets married without the permission of a wali, then the nikah is invalid. So I had to go running around to a sheikh and everything. I had the answer, but I was like, no, man, this, 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 this is a fatwa. 
is a very, very delicate matter. The issues pertaining to talaq, right? Validity of the ins and the outs of a nikah, situations like this that come to light, it's not for everyone to give an answer. We have a big sheikh in Al-Medina. His beard is white. His name is Sheikh Saleh Sahimi. You go to him and you ask him about divorce-related issues. He says, no, 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 go, 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 to, go to the courts. Don't ask me. Doesn't answer. Let's be honest. Someone will come to you and say, oh, this happened and then that happened. It's only half of the story. So, hey, a lot of the time there is more to it. Am I wrong to say that? Hmm? Sisters, we're hearing a lot of cracks. I don't know what you're breaking. Huh? Please. Tell me, shalom, ta'ala, I'm going to. Huh? By the way, where are you from? Lubnani? Palestine. Of course. Of course. So the brother is asking a very good question. Because the kufr has to be clear as daylight. So was he now supposed to go and check? Naam, you need to go do your research. It's a big thing here. You're making that which is haram upon you halal. She's haram for you. Touching her, going anywhere near her, is haram. Right? So anyways, going back to this, I was going to mention, but then I forgot. Good that you reminded me. This brother done a bit of research. He asked, okay, Taib, you told me that he was a kafir. I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't do my research. What makes you think that he's a kafir? She goes, Wallahi, there was a time we went to visit him for three days, right? I personally didn't see him pray. Wallahi said this. So at a time, so I said, said, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Were you watching him at every time of the day? Maybe he went upstairs. There's a possibility he's gone upstairs and he's prayed by himself, say. Well, I, I didn't check, but in front of me, he didn't pray. I've come ac- across other cases where a sister would say that my father is not going to be the wali because he's a mubtidir. He's an innovator. Say, why is he an innovator? You ask her, she goes, um, he sits in front of Al Jazeera. And Al Jazeera is an Ikhwani type, right? Uh, news outlet. And he quotes Al Jazeera all the time. So I don't believe he's on the Sunnah. Uqsimu billahi al-azim. Yeah, of course, of course. If it was done with khata'an, and you explained to him, look, I accidentally gave it to you twice. It was only, the agreement was 200. And I saw that I gave it to you. He has to give it back. And the hasal bin khata'a. Again, this is when al umuru bi maqasidiha, the other leading legal maxim comes into practice. I gave him that based on our first agreement. The intention was not to give it to him twice. Right? Can you see how the other leading legal maxim comes into tact here? That matters are judged by their intentions. But we're going to come on to that, inshallah. So I'm going to give you guys, inshallah, 53 past. Can I have a uh, tfadl? Last question, I'm going to give you a five minute break and then we'll come back. I know there's going to be half of the class is going to leave. No problem. Huh? Yeah. Sorry? You're going to have to raise your voice. Ahsant, oh, waswas. I really wanted to do it, speak about it. Someone has waswas now pertaining to wudu, right? And salah. Sakumlachar, you guys are really. Waswas, how do we deal with waswas? Well, now we've taken this principle, right? There are some people who struggle with the whispers of the devil, waswas. He goes into the bathroom before Fajr and he doesn't come out except till after sunrise. It's constantly washing, washing, washing. Maybe I didn't do it properly. Oh, did I do it three times? Did I do it twice? You see what he's what? Struggling with. This is a disease. It is a problem. May Allah Azza wa Jal cure them from that. There is a principle when it comes to waswasa. I really hope you guys write this down. It is lahtiyata lil muwaswisi. When we go into the bathroom, someone who is not suffering from waswasa, what do we need to ensure? That we do it properly, right? We have to make sure that we've washed everything properly. Sah? When you're making wudu. From the fingertip all the way to the elbow, you have to make sure that you've done it properly. As for this guy who's suffering from waswasa, we say, 
he doesn't right do his checks right he doesn't go out his way to ensure that he's done it properly because he's suffering we say there is no right ihtiyat here do the wudu once and get out of the toilet this is what we say to him because his has a he has an exceptional circumstance Make the wudu once and get out. Wallah, I even had one of my shuyukh, Sheikh Saleh Sindi, mention this kind of person, you need to drag him out of the toilet. Otherwise, he's going to stay in there for a very long time. I'll tell you guys a story. A sister called me and she said, my husband, this is when I was in Medina. I think she messaged through a brother and then the brother messaged me and something along the lines of that. And it was like the sister is very concerned. Her husband, kada, kada. What's her husband going through? Waswasa. So can Abu Taymiyyah come now and speak to him? All right? Or maybe help him out. He lived near Masjid Quba. Do you guys know what Masjid Quba is in Medina? Masjid Quba. That's in Salah Alayhi said, whoever makes Man Tatahara and then he goes and prays Torah there. It is as if he performed Umrah Ahsant. So I went. It was the time of the Maghrib. Right? We walked towards the masjid. And he goes, I need to make wudu. Okay. We go into the wudu area in Masjid Quba. Oh, Wallahi brothers. I don't want to call it the perfect wudu. But as far as I'm concerned, from what I know in how to make wudu, ma'al isbaq, doing it properly, he did exactly that. Only perfect wudu is the wudu of the Prophet. Um, but he did wudu like, you know, properly. I said, let's go. Because I haven't done it properly. And he done it the first time so properly, Allahumma barik. He goes, I haven't done it properly. I told him, get up and get out. I'm so close to pulling him out of the wudu area. As we're walking, and this is me getting physical with him now, Akhi. I'm actually pulling him and everyone's looking at me. Everyone knows what's going on. Right? He keeps repeating to me, Akhi, my salah is not going to be valid. I haven't done it properly. I said, walk. We went, because it was COVID, era, COVID period. We had to pray outside. We didn't have masks. Guess who walks past? Have you guys heard of Sheikh Ali Hudayfi? Famous Qari from Medina, Ali Hudayfi. The salah has started and he's still going on. I'm not going to pray. This is wrong. You know, I'm going to get into trouble with Allah if I pray now. And me and him are arguing back and forth, back and forth. No one else is saying anything because they know what's going on. They feel sorry for him. Shaykh Hudayfi walks past and he shouts at us. Fear Allah and pray. Why are you guys standing there? It's like Shaykh Hifoni knew what's going on, right? And then Sheikh just walked into the masjid. Right? And then Wallahi, I just had to leave him. And just started praying. Walked off. Back to his house. A shahid min al-kalam. You are someone who's suffering from waswasa. Lahtiyata lil muwaswas. You don't make sure that you've done it properly. You do it once and you get out. Same likewise when it comes to the salah. Same likewise when it comes to ghusl. Does that make sense? He doesn't do those checks like we would normally do individuals who are not suffering from waswasa. It's exactly three o'clock now. Guys, five minutes and then we're going to come back inshallah ta'ala. Take the remaining legal maxims. I'm really enjoying myself. I hope you guys are as well. Well, I love knowledge, brothers, especially lessons. I'm tired of lectures. All right? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa usalli wa usalli ma'ala al-mab'uthi rahmatan al-alameen. بعث الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا الله بإذنه والسراج المنيرا. Let's see how many people last all the way till the end of the program. Inshallah. The next leading legal maxim, my brothers and my sisters, that we want to uh, take, inshallah ta'ala, is الضرر يزال. Eliminating harm or the elimination of harm. The Sharia, my brothers and my sisters, it came to remove the harm that one may be caused or one may cause to others. Right? If you look at the tarif of this, is 
causing others harm, right? In all cases, right? Or sometimes what happens is one tries to bring about benefit for himself but causes others, right, harm when in the process of bringing himself some good. Like you're trying to do something for yourself that is good, but in the process of doing so, you harm others. Right? I'll give you guys an example. You have some waste or some trash that you want to burn in your garden. Are you allowed to burn things inside of your garden? It's your garden, right? You want to get rid of it. You want to burn this waste. Are you guys with me? However, all of the ashes and the smoke is going to go into the homes of your neighbors. Is this bringing them benefit or is it causing them harm? It's causing them harm. Does that make sense? It is causing them harm. So you don't bring benefit to yourself, right? While in the process of doing so, you're causing harm to others. Does that make sense? So, in general, yuzal, the elimination of harm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُمْسِكُهُنَّ ضِرَارًا لِتَعْتَدُوا You know you don't want to be with this lady. You don't want to be with her. So you divorce her. What's her waiting period? What's her waiting period? The waiting period of a divorced woman. Two months, three months. Three months. I think we've got a couple of views here. Scholars have differed and taken two different views. <laughs> How many? Is it three months? Even three months is not accurate. Ahsentum. Three menstrual cycles. Because the cycles of a woman can be a lot shorter. Sahih? When I was teaching the other day, and my sister says, I strongly advise you watch it, and you brothers as well. It is called Everything You Need to Know About Menses. A three hour course. I got tired of questions from our sisters that are so repetitive about their menses. So I decided to record everything you need to know about menses. Anytime a sister asks me a question, I tell her, watch three hours. Learn it properly instead of what? There's microwave knowledge of asking a question and getting an answer. Right? Watch the whole three hours. And in it, I spoke about this to some detail. How there was a lady in the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, she had three menstrual cycles in the same month. There was three menstrual cycles in the same month. So if you say now three months, then it's not accurate. Can you guys see? It's three menstrual cycle and it depends on who and how many days it goes on for and whatever have you. So now Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَا تُمْسِكُهُنَّ ضِرَانِ تَعْتَلُوا So her menstrual cycle is about to come to an end and then you have this divorcee, this man who has divorced his wife, right? Who wants to cause her harm. He doesn't want to keep her. So maybe what? A couple of hours before the three menstrual cycle is about to finish? He says, I've taken you back. But he doesn't actually want to take her back. He just wants to play games with her. Does that make sense? Because after the three menstrual cycles, she's now allowed to get married to somebody else. So Allah says, Don't just hold on to her, causing her harm. Right? Also Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَا تُضَارُوهُنَّ لِتُضَيِّقُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ Right? أَسْكِنُوهُنَّ مِنْ حَيْثُ سَكَنْتُمْ مِنْ وُجِدِكُمْ وَلَا تُضَارُوهُنَّ لِتُضَيِّقُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ When you get married, situate her where you live, right? Keep her where you live. However, don't make things difficult for her, right? Be reasonable. She's now been living in a three-bedroom house all of her life and now you put her in somewhere very, very small. This is going to bring her a lot of discomfort, a lot of hardship. Be reasonable. 
as you can see, all of these verses, my brothers and my sisters, right, are verses that show that one should not cause harm to others. Whether it may be him causing harm for the sake of it, or he's trying to get some benefit out of it, and in the process, it causes harm to others. Right? Also, Allah Azza wa Jalla in Surah Al-Baqarah, He talks about um, the wali making things difficult. Right? One shouldn't do that. If she wants to get married, facilitate it. Don't just be difficult and so on and so forth. So under this leading legal maxim, I want to mention about three principles that branch off this three... Le uh, sorry. I want to mention three principles, right? Or three legal maxims that branch off this leading legal maxim. I think you guys will love this. Before I mention these three, I want you guys to understand the following. Imam Al-Si'ad, he has a manzoma. He has a poem called Al-Qawa'id al fakhiya where he discusses that which is similar. And one of the lines of poetry that he mentions in there is, الدين مبني على المصالح في جلبها ودرء للقبائح The whole religion revolves around weighing the pros and the cons. In securing benefits and warding off harms. Are you brothers and sisters with me? The whole religion revolves around weighing the pros and the cons. Right? Let alone specific matters that an individual may be challenged with. The whole religion revolves around it. This is very, very key. Does that make sense? The whole religion revolves around weighing the pros and the cons. So three principles that I want to mention, inshaAllah ta'ala. The first scenario, my brothers and my sisters, is one finds himself in a predicament, right? And he is faced now with two evils. He's faced with two evils. You guys with me? There's no way that he can what? Ward both of these evils out of the situation that he's in. He has to pick one of the two. There's no way around it. What do you do here, my brothers and my sisters? Ahsant. You hear this a lot in English. Take the lesser of the two evils. Right? If you're in a predicament where you have to pick one of two evil things, because there's no way around it, because the first step is, how can I get rid of both of them? If you can eliminate both of these harms or both of these evils, you have to do that. But if you can't, you're in the predicament where you have to do one of two things. What do you do? You pick the lesser of the two evils. And this is very, very important. Knowing خير الخيرين wa شر الشرين. Right? شر الشرين, the worst of the two evils that you are faced with. Huh? Western politicians. They have to do a lot of that, huh? So here are some examples, my brothers and my sisters. Let me ask you guys a question. Is it allowed for one to cut open the stomach of a dead person? Generally speaking. Is it allowed? This person just passed away, I'm going to open his stomach. Is that allowed? <laughs> my Jews. It's haram. Right? It is haram. However, when this lady passed away, she was pregnant. The life of this child is on the line, right? The life of this child is on the line, my brothers and my sisters. It is allowed, brothers and sisters, to cut open the stomach of this lady, which is of course an evil. Allowing this child to die also is an evil. But which one is the lesser of the two evils? That you cut open the stomach of this lady that has passed away. 
Because leaving this child that could potentially still live on, it's a big evil. From the maqasid of the sharia is the preservation of life, sahih? This is very, very important. Knowing the lesser of the two evils here. I actually had a question that somebody posed to me a couple of years ago along the lines of this. Right? Another example, my brothers and my sisters. We have an Imam, as soon as he finishes the Jum'ah, he goes outside and he starts smoking. Do you guys think? Is it far-fetched that something like this can happen? I'm not surprised. We got that which is far worse happening. Imams are getting very colorful now. Hmm? This Imam, as soon as he finishes the Jum'ah, he goes outside and he lights his cigar. He's having a cigar in front of everyone. Is this appropriate, guys, for an Imam? Yasrah. Is he fit to be the Imam? It's not fit. If you want to sin, you don't start doing it in front of everyone. And even then, it's wrong. This is not fit for your position. To be behaving like that behind closed doors anyway, let alone in front of the people. Agreed? So a, brother, so a group of brothers, they get together, they were like, we need to get this guy out of the masjid. And the only way that they're going to get him out of the masjid is by causing a war where his tribe is going to end up fighting with these brothers and potentially there might be bloodshed. Or the council. Who, what do you guys, do you guys call the council? The Baladia? Which someone huh? Baladia. Huh? Or the mayor of the city is going to come and close down the masjid. Right? So now we are in the lesser of the two evils. Either you keep him as an imam, or all of these things could potentially happen. Which one is the lesser of the two evils? Leave this smoke cigaring imam in place, or in position. Do we want the masjid to be closed down? No, of course not. Do we want... Two groups of people now to start killing one another? Or to be at war with one another? Ma'rifatu sharri sharrain. To know huh, the worst of the two scenarios so we can end up taking the lesser of the two evils. Make sense this example? May Allah not test you guys with that. Lying is allowed. Are you allowed to lie? That might so. You're at home, and then some Arawa says they come and knock on your door. Where is your brother? <laughs> your brother's upstairs, he's playing FIFA. And these guys are going to take his life. There's a lot of killings in Ottawa, right? A lot of shootings, right? And then they ask you, where's your brother? You're in this predicament. You either tell them the truth and then they run up on your house. Or you lie to them and then they leave. Right? So you're between now lying and also what? Potentially a life being taken. Which one is the lesser of the two evils? Huh? Lying. فَيَجُوزُ الْكَذِبُ فِي هَذِي الْحَالَةِ it is allowed for you now to lie in this scenario. This is why, you know, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he said that lying is not allowed except in three cases. One of them is when you're doing sulh, when you're rectifying between two brothers. Either you lie or these two, especially if they're two individuals that have a lot of influence, they're going to be at war with one another and they're going to be far away and apart from one another. So you're allowed to lie in order to Bring a betterment out of the situation. I like this example. Very relevant, especially in today's day and age. You have a father who's very fearful for his daughter. Zina is a widespread. Huh? Zina is widespread, right? From the signs of the hour, the Messenger of told us is that knowledge becomes less, ignorance becomes widespread, and also Zina 
becomes prevalent. Every father is terrified. My daughter, Taymiyyah, she's two years of age, and wallah, every now and again, when I look at her, this fear, you know, begins to grow inside of my heart. She grows older, it's going to be the situation. All right, she's got green eyes, you know. Akhafa alayha. Because no guys, they like green eyes, huh? Point being, my brothers and my sisters, is there's something that scares a father. How is she going to turn out? What's going to happen to her? Is she going to now fall victim to a zina al fahisha, which could be the reason that her deen spirals out of control? Sahih. So now, this father who's been worried all of his time, two people come and ask for his daughter's hand in marriage. Pay attention now. You got Muhammad who shaves his beard completely and he has other evil things that he might do that are displeasing to Allah. However, he's someone whose tawheed is good. Right? And generally speaking, he ascribes to the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's trying to follow the sunnah. However, not everyone is perfect. You're going to have shortcomings, right? That's Muhammad. On the other hand, you have Ibrahim. Ibrahim, my brothers and my sisters, he practices innovation, but he has a beard. And he doesn't do all of these evil things that the first does. Which one is the lesser of the two evils? This guy stays on top of his ibadat. And, however, he preaches innovation. His mind has been polluted by innovated practices. And we know, right, that innovations are evil. Isn't it so? Which one's the two, less of two evils? Which one's worse, the first or the second? Huh? Innovations is adding new things into the religion. Do you see what I'm saying? Huh? No, I'm like newly invented matters that have been introduced into the religion, which the religion is free from. Are you guys with me? Which one is the lesser of the two evils now? The first or the second? Why is it? Why? I'll tell you guys. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, Al bid'atu ahabbu ila iblis min al ma'asiyah. Bid'a, innovations, are more beloved to iblis than sins. I meet a lot of brothers, rappers, trappers, right, drug dealers. And whenever I sit down with them, they always say, Akhi, please make dua for me, man. Please. Or a guy who's in a haram relationship says, please make dua for me. I don't like her. But I'm just stuck in his relationship with her because of a child that I had with her. Like, please make dua. He knows that what she's doing is wrong. And he's saying to make dua for me. However, the guy that's practicing innovation, my brothers and my sisters, he believes he's getting closer to Allah. Isn't it so? He believes he's getting closer to Allah. Right? For example, he's celebrating the Prophet's birthday. Or he's doing this or he's doing that. That is outside of what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions practiced. Right? For example, this practice now, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't do it. The companions didn't do it. Imam Abu Hanifa didn't do it. Imam Shafi'i, Malik, Ahmed, they all didn't do it. And then later on, it was something that was introduced, which then became a matter that is practiced under the realm of Islam. If it was really a good thing, then the companions would have definitely done it. We don't love the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than them. The way we need to be, my brothers and my sisters, is that we follow Quran, Sunnah upon whose understanding? Sahaba, Tabi'in, wa Atba'u Tabi'in. No. That's how it should be. Not me, or not my uncle, or not my dad, or my Sheikh, or your Sheikh. No. My job and my teacher's job is just to tell me what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. This is our religion. Does that make sense? And these four great Imams, Imam Ahmad, Abu Hanifa, Shafi, and Malik, they tried their utmost best, right, in giving us a package that is ready in how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This one, when somebody says to me, I'm not going to follow madhab, I'm going to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, I say to them, huh? these four great Imams, what were they preaching? The Torah and the Injil? The Bible and the Torah? 
What kind of answer is this? They had a hadith, they had verses, right? Which they extrapolated and deduced uh, rulings from. And then they packaged it for us, which we... I'd rather follow Imam Ahmed than someone that's contemporary. Huh? So which one's the lesser of two evils, guys? Huh? First one's the lesser of two evils. Because he has Tawheed and he's following the Sunnah. As for the other one, he's practicing innovations and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, وَشَرُّ الْأُمُورِ The worst of the things is the innovative practice which we hear on the minbar every week. Does that make sense? كل عباد لم يتعبد بأصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه فلا تتعبد بها أبو الدرداء said any act of worship that the companions didn't do don't do it right so it's actually a very evil thing that's why we hear it and the messiahs used to say it all the time the worst of the things are the innovated bid'i type practices that may be carried out طيب Someone's chasing after you and he's trying to shoot you. Right? And you know, the only way you can protect your life is to hide behind a shop. These guys are going to spray the shop, huh? And you go running into the shop, knowing that you can shut the door and save your life. What do you do here? Do you allow your life to be taken or do you run into the shop? Huh? Maybe it's going to get sprayed by bullets. Huh? No, it's empty. Maybe there's one guy in there, but it's going to get sprayed, but you can hide, you can lock it. And then... Allah Kareem, he said. He <laughs> said, Allah is generous. Huh? Scholars, they mention here, if this is the only way you could protect yourself, you do so. Right? However, after the shop got sprayed, right? Who needs to hold responsibility? Hmm? You need to pay for it after. That's mine. You are going to be held liable for that because you were the cause for it. Well, Khata or Ikrah or Nisyan or Askata or Mabud or Rahman or Lakin Ma'alit Lafi, yes, but to the bedel. We enter fit the theme or Anhu as Zalal. Something, some lines of poetry that I mentioned where you know how when we were young we used to uh, play, you guys say soccer. Huh? We call it football. We'd be kicking football, right? And then we'd smash a window. And then the owner comes and says, it was a mistake. Yeah. And I remember there was even a guy one time, he said, Allah says, Rabbana la tu'akhidna in nasina wa akhta'na. Ya Allah, don't hold us to account for that which you've done out of mistake. So we're free. No. If it involves now the rights of others, you're going to be held liable. You've done it out of mistake. Naam. Allah is not going to hold you to account for something that you've done out of mistake or out of forgetfulness, but you need to, you're still held liable, are you not? So now, you're about to get sprayed, and I know it happens a lot here in Ottawa. Gunman is going to hunt you down, and you run into the shop, right? That's how you're going to save your life. This is the lesser of two evils. Another example that is similar to this now, guys, is, right? I borrowed Farhan $10,000, Canadian dollars. And he's holding on to it for me, right? And then some people, they storm into the house. They run up into the house. They run up into the house. He's got 5,000 somewhere and another 5,000 elsewhere. Is he allowed to give them some of that money? in order now to protect life and perhaps even the rest of the money. What's the lesser of the two evils here? Because he has to go somewhere, right? 5,000 is maybe in the kitchen. Another 5,000 under the sofa. This guy knows that he has money. He's holding a gun to his head. And he's thinking to himself, oh, Abu Taim is going to get angry with me. Right? What does he do here? Huh? Huh? All of the money? Whatever is going to cause this individual to be repelled, right? Yeah, so he goes, look, okay, I'm going to give you whatever I have. 
He goes there, gives him the 5,000, oh, 5,000. And he gets off. This is the lesser of the two evils. You don't say, okay, I've got 5,000 here and I've got another five. Let me go get it for you as well. Here. Tfadal. No, I might see it. Sahih? He gets with me. No, but I'm not going to harm Firhan. Huh? He said, what if the loan is going to harm him? Akhi Abu Taymiyyad. Hmm? But I don't think the loaner himself is going to like reach a point where he's going to end up shooting you down. Sahih? Hmm. Sorry? You have to kill someone to protect another's life. Huh? No, no, no. This is not something that you can't take someone's life now in order to protect another person's life. And he's saying to you, you have to go and kill him? And you're going to have to give me the scenario properly. So they come into your house, they're robbing you, and they want to kill someone. Huh. Well, I have to try and assess the situation, try and do the lesser of the two evils. Huh? To try and figure that out, do some ijtihad. No. Does that make sense now? So what do you do here? You take the lesser of the two evils. You give 5,000 and you don't give the other 5,000. Right? You guys with me? Mm. Yeah, of course. He's going to have to pay it back. You're going to have to pay it back. Well, of course. Of course, you can take out a baseball bat and whack his, you know, self-defense is called, yeah? Sheikh, please, can we do it after? Inshallah. You got to go? Okay, okay, tell you, what's your question? Hmm. Sheikh, I've given them a hundred pieces of advices. This is so common. You know, I've got like videos upon videos on this. Um... Inshallah, we'll get it sent to you, Bidnillah Ta'ala. Is that right? Inshallah Ta'ala. But it's very, very common, and I feel you, and it's a problem, it's an issue, and may Allah Azza wa guide them, you know, help them. Um, this is going to take me a long time to actually go into all of it, and then we're kind of running out of time. I don't want to do this second time, and we haven't finished it. Is that right? Inshallah. Zakir Akhir. Taib, next predicament, my brothers and my sisters, that I want to mention is, there are some fruits that are growing in a garden. And you're going to die because simply, right, um, that's the only thing that you find now. If you don't eat from it, you're going to die. This is pretty straightforward. Are you allowed to take from someone else's garden now to feed your hunger? Are you allowed to? Yes, you are. Remember this, my brothers and my sisters, and we're going to keep getting a lot of scenarios, right? The preservation of life is above everything else, right? You're even allowed to utter a statement of kufr in order to protect life. Uttering a statement of kufr is allowed. Of course not. Can I utter a statement of disbelief? But someone's got a gun to my head. He has a gun to my head, right? And he's saying that you have to go and utter a statement of kufr. Like imagine, and I ask Allah to protect me from this, right? That I go up on the mimbar on a Friday afternoon and I start saying that Jesus is the son of God. Don't make takfir on me straight away, guys, if you ever see that. Huh? Don't make takfir on me. Maybe because someone's holding a gun to my head. Hmm? And I utter it. Does Allah allow me to do so? Without a shadow of a doubt. Right? Allah says in the Quran, إلا من أكره وقلبه مطمئن بالإيمان من كفر بالله من بعد إيمانه إلا من أكره وقلبه مطمئن بالإيمان. The only exemption that was made is someone who has now been coerced, forced into uttering a statement of kufr. Because that which is on the line is the loss of life. And Islam came to protect that. If you go into the maqasid of Sharia. The objective of Sharia, one of them is Hifdun Nafs. The preservation of what? Soul. Taib, the next one. Oh. In the month of Ramadan, right, one's lust 
spirals out of control. One's lust spirals out of control. And he has two wives. One wife is fasting, and the other wife is what? On her menses. And he has to have sexual intercourse. There's no other way. You guys are probably wondering, can he do this? Can he do No. We have this scenario, right? Where he can't use his own self now to relieve himself. And he has these two wives, and the only way that he could save his private part is by having sexual intercourse. Otherwise, his testicles are going to explode. This is discussed in the books of fiqh. Don't laugh, guys. This is discussed in the books of fiqh. Which one is the lesser of the two evils? Now to have sexual intercourse with his wife that is fasting, or the one on the menses? The one who is fasting is the lesser of two evils. Someone said menses. Fasting, you agree with him? He has sexual intercourse with the one. That's the lesser of two evils, huh? Who can tell me why? Tell me why. And having sexual intercourse with women on mass is haram. Sahih? Huh? He basically said that they would have to make up two months. Shahrayni mutatabi'ain. If one has sexual intercourse while they are fasting. Mm. On a menses. He said you're causing harm to the one who's on a menses. Adam, what do you think? Huh? First or the second? The one who's fasting or the one who's on a menses? Which one's worse? The one on a menses worse? Huh? Which one is worse? A woman on her menses or the one who is actually fasting? I think the mic's tight. Is there an alternative? You guys with me? This one's actually better. Sahih? Which one's better? First or second? Which one's the less of two evils? This mic or that mic? <laughs> huh? You think it's worse now to have sexual intercourse with a woman that's fasting? Type. I know it's a hard one, huh? Hmm. He said that she also have to fast later on as well. Taib, I'll tell you guys which one is worse. عندنا نص في الباب. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, من أتى كاهنا أو حائضا Whoever visits a fortune teller or has sexual intercourse with a woman on her menses. Right? فَقَدْ بَرِئَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ فَقَدْ كَفَرْ Whoever does any of these two things, then indeed, right, he's become free of what Allah Azza wa Jal sent down upon his Prophet. And in another narration, he has committed kufr. Which one's worse now, guys? Huh? I know it's a hard one. I can see where you guys might say the other one. It's understandable. And this hadith, as you can see, is very, very serious. Does that make sense? Taib. Another important example that Al-Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned and before him Mujahid ibn Jabbar who was the student of Abdullah ibn Abbas made mention of this. And this is discussed also by Shaykh Al-Sam Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi. Right. These brothers and sisters don't get the wrong end of the stick. I know there's some little kids as well so I'm going to try and be as vague in my wording as possible. No one say to me, why are you discussing this? Look what they're teaching our children in school. Right? And what they're giving nine roles to do for homework. Wallahi, haya'an, out of shyness, I don't feel comfortable even mentioning it. And I think you guys are aware. Right? Teaching them how to go enjoy themselves and what they need to do to themselves in order to feel that, huh? This is what they're giving them as homework now. 
And I discussed it in my course that I done on menses. Everything a woman needs to know about menses. It's on my channel, it's three hours. We have a situation where a brother just came out of a haram relationship. This is key here. Because we're talking about tahayyat lahul asbab. Someone who was falling into haram. And genuinely, he might well fall back into haram. You know, sometimes we get this case where a brother, he says, Wallah, I fear for myself. I fear for myself. You are a type who really genuinely fears for himself. He's going to fall into haram. And then the other guy, Wallah, is just, yeah, Wallah, I fear for myself. But he's not going to do anything anyway. We're talking about someone who genuinely fears from tahayyat lahul asbab. For example, someone came out of a haram relationship where he used to fall into a zina. Right? So the predicament is, he either is going to fall into a zina because she's calling him, or he's going to what? Masturbate. Which one's the lesser of the two evils? A zina or the other? The other. Imam Ahmed rahmatullahi alayhi mentions this in these exceptional circumstances and Ibn Taymiyyah than taqreer of that. Does that make sense? هذا أمر مهم جدا ينبغي أن يعرف. And sometimes you have to tell this brother this. To stop him now from doing that which is worse. Right? And the key word here is تهيأت له الأسباب. That he has the means now to go and do haram. Not some guy who has never had a haram and he's saying, oh, I fear for myself. Can I go do it? No, you can't. You get that? No one walk away taking out of context where I said, oh, the speaker that came after Dhuhr, he said, you can go and do this. And then they write it on TikTok, that shaitan talk. Huh? I did not say that. Another, I think, important scenario is, جواز السكوت عن المنكر إذا كان في إنكاره ضرر أكبر منه كالكلام على الرافضة الذين سيقتلون الناس ويسفكون دماءهم. If we see someone now cursing the companions, is it correct to remain silent? He's cursing the companions. Is it correct now to remain silent? It's not. What did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? Man ra'a minkum munkaran fal? Yugayyiru biyadu. Whoever sees an evil, he should try to change it with his hand. If you can't change it with his hand, he has to change it with his tongue. You can't change it with the tongue, you have to change it with heart. Al-amru bil-ma'roof wa nahyu anil munkar is what? Something that is mandatory. In joining the good and forbidding the evil is something that is a must. However, there was a scenario that we found ourselves in when I was in Yemen. And I was thinking a lot about it recently because I've seen two different dealings on this matter. We had, of course, those who would curse the companions and would also not shy away from taking people's lives that were surrounding the institute that we were studying in. Right? You speak about them with all of the garbage that they come with, all of the filth and the evil, of cursing the companions and every other kufr that they might have. And there is a possibility that they're going to start attacking innocent Muslims, even women and children. You are in this predicament. Which one is the lesser of the two evils? To remain silent, which is of course wrong, or for them now to start killing people? Remain silent even though it hurts to remain silent because they are cursing Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And they are cursing the companions of Waqan Umar. There was another institute elsewhere where the Sheikh, who was also in this predicament, he's seen what they've done, right? And he started saying things that would make an individual think, how can he even say this? Right? How can he even say this? And a lot of people got angry for him saying this. But why is he saying this? Because he's trying to protect the lives of who? Women and children. Remember what I said before. You are allowed to utter a statement of kufr in order to protect life. Allah said this in the Quran. 
Man kafara billahi min ba'di iman illa man ukrih wa qalbuhu mutma'innu bil iman. Generally speaking, you can't utter kufr. You can't. But you are in an exceptional circumstance where someone's going to take your life or the life of your children or the life of the community. In that case, am I allowed to compromise with my religion? Of course you can. Remember what I said, the preservation of life is above everything else. Does that make sense? So that sheikh in the other part of Yemen, he would say whatever they needed to hear because he knew if he didn't or he didn't sign a certain treaty, they might do the exact same thing that they did elsewhere. And that is innocent women and children's lives will be taken. To know the lesser of the two evils, right? It's what really shows the fiqh of an individual. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? Everybody with me so far? Did everyone get that? We have, this one's very, very important, right? We have a very famous person that made a mistake. We have a very famous person who made a mistake, has a huge following. However, this mistake of his, right, was only noticed maybe by a thousand people online. And normally, subhanAllah, millions of people listen to him. You might point out this mistake publicly. And by the way, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, talks about this. Right? You might point out his mistake, but then, أَخَذَتْهُ الْعِزَّةُ بِالْإِثْمِ His ego will get the better of him, and then he will come out and justify this mistake of his. Right? Are you brothers and sisters with me now? Sometimes you know the shaitan gets the better of people. The ego gets in the way. And then this issue is going to become bigger than it actually is. Ibn al-Qayyim says, وَمِن دَقِيقِ الْفَطِنَ أَنَّكَ لَا تَرُدُّ عَلَى الْمُطَاعِ خَطَأَهُ بَيْنَ الْمَلَأ Goes from, that which shows the, right, the specifics of one's intelligence. Is that if someone has a big following, you don't rebuke him publicly, right? Especially if there is a possibility that فَتَحْمِلُهُ رُتْبَتُهُ عَلَى نُصْرَةِ الْخَطَةِ That he's going to come out and justify this mistake of his. And then more people now might become affected by this mistake. Right? وَذَلِكَ خَطَأٌ ثَانٍ This is now a second mistake. Right. We mentioned if we have a solution to the problem, which is to advise him privately, then you should. But we'll draw this scenario now. There's no way that you can get to him. That mistake of his, it reached only a thousand people. If you now rebuke him publicly, he'll come out and justify it, and it will reach a million people. Which one is the lesser of the two evils? That you remain silent, right? Or you rebuke him publicly and then a million people end up getting the wrong end of the deen. Which one is the lesser of two evils? Remain silent. This is what Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned. Undur ila fiqhi. And he was someone that wouldn't shy away from pointing out that which was khata, that which was mistaken. But at times it's best to just, especially if a lot of people haven't come to know about that. Right? لَيْسَ مِنْ فِقْهِ الرَّدِّ تَشْهِيرْ مَنْ لَيْسَ بِمَشْهُورْ This is very, very important. And the world of Twitter has given everyone a platform to say whatever they want. If someone is not well known and he has said something that is problematic, and you, mashallah, tabarakallah, have a huge following. Sometimes people say to me, Ustad, you need to speak about this matter. I was like, okay, tell you what happened. He goes, oh, this guy. Who is this guy? No one knows who this guy is. And he's spreading some falsehood. He goes, you should point it out on your Twitter so people don't get affected. I was like, yeah, jama'ah. This guy is unknown. La wujud lahu. Nakira min nakirat. No one knows who he is. And now you want me to start speaking about him on my following. On Twitter, maybe what? 70,000 people might end up seeing it? Why am I going to make something known when it is unknown to the people? Right? Does that make sense? لَيْسَ مِنْ فِقْهِ الرَّدْ تَشْهِيرْ مَنْ لَيْسَ بِمَشْهُورْ You don't make something known when it's unknown. Or give it publicity when in reality, right? It's very highly unlikely that this is going to reach a lot of people. Did everyone get that? 
So this is now the first scenario where we have a predicament and there's no way around both of these evils that have been presented to you. There's no way out of it. You have to pick one of the two evils. What do we do? You take the lesser of the two evils. As the brother mentioned, this is very well practiced in politics, huh? Taking the lesser of the two evils. No. Inshallah ta'ala, it's 57 past. Please come back in three minutes, guys. If you need to quickly just go up and down, up and down, up and down, do star jumps and then sit back down again. And then we're going to take the remaining, inshallah ta'ala. I prefer this one over that one. We've got 1,200 tickets, huh? I'm really enjoying myself right now. I can sit here till Fajr tomorrow. And we're going through Al-Qawa'id al Huh? You guys enjoying it? It's better than a lecture, right? Adam, should we cancel the second program to stay here? Huh? I just want to say hello all day. Well, I, I like the message as well. It looks beautiful. Cameraman, do you have enough video for the rest of Fajr? Huh? Good. Type. So now we're take, currently taking the second leading legal maxim, which is the elimination of harm. And we said we would mention three principles, right? That stem off from this leading legal maxim. Sahih? We've already taken one. You're in a predicament, right? And there's no way around it, except that you have to do one of the two evils. What do you do? You take the lesser of the two evils. The second principle that we want to take is... When you are in a situation where in this predicament some good is going to come out of it and also some benefit is going to come out of it. Right? Some evil is going to come out of the situation and also some benefit. You can't get rid of the evil completely. Are you guys with me? Some good is going to come out of it and some what? Evil is going to come out of it. Right? What do you do here? What do you do here? Under this principle, guys, we can mention what? Three different scenarios as well. Right? The first scenario, my brothers and my sisters, is if the pros, sorry, if the cons are going to outweigh the pros, do you do this thing here? Yeah? 70% of that which is going to come out of the situation is bad. And 30% is good. Here, the cons, they outweigh the pros. The bad outweighs the good. Do you do this act? That's the first one, and I think we're clear on it. Second scenario, the good outweighs the bad. Actually, I'm going to come on to that. Wait, we'll make the number three. You have the second scenario, which is 50-50. Good is going to come out of this, and also bad is going to come out of it. But it is like, what, 50-50? Do you do it? Do you not? This is when we have this principle. دَرْءُ الْمَفْسَدَةِ مُقَدَّمٌ عَلَى جَلْبِ الْمَصْلَحَةِ إِذَا تَسَاوَيَا Right? If we have this predicament, where there are pros and cons, good and bad, if it's like 50-50, what do you do here? You don't do it. That which you give precedence to is warding of the evil over acquiring that benefit. I think that's also like pretty straightforward, right? Then you have this third scenario, my brothers and my sisters. When you're in this predicament, good is going to come out of it and also bad. But the good, it outweighs the bad that will come out of the situation. Should you now go forth in doing this act? No. And this is what I want to elaborate on, inshallah ta'ala, and bring a lot of examples. Mainly. There might be some other examples of the other two, but inshallah ta'ala, you guys will get the gist as I will ask you whether the bad here outweighs the good. Right? The reason why I think it's very, very important, my brothers and my sisters, because in the past, there were so many good opportunities that presented itself, and some very good brothers, they turned it down. Why? Because they said some bad is going to come out of it. And they misunderstood that principle. That was mentioned by both Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn Taymiyyah, and also Tajuddin al-Subki. They would say, إِذَا تَعَارَضَتِ الْمَصْلَحَةُ وَالْمَفْسَدَ قُدِّمَ أَرْجَحُهُمَا If you're in a predicament, 
and some good and bad is going to come out of it, you take, right, or you go with the one that has more benefit. Or whichever pros or cons are going to outweigh the other, you deal with it accordingly, as we just gave these scenarios. Does that make sense? So now you have this predicament. More good is going to come out of this situation than bad. Should you just turn it down because the principle stays Darul Mafsalati Muqaddaman ala Jalb al Masaha? Warding the evil takes precedence over the acquiring of good. No, there is an ending to it. If it is equal, only then you don't do it. But if there is more benefit that's going to come out of it, then maybe the bad that will come out of the situation, you don't just say, I'm not going to do it because there's some bad that comes out of the situation. Like in a 70-30 situation, 70% good and then 30% bad. No, this is a good opportunity now, my brothers and my sisters, that you are what? Huh? Turning down. Give you guys a scenario, right? I remember many, many years ago, many years ago. And by the way, I come from an institute where they held the view that, you know, taking digital photos and videos is haram, major sin. And they have a point. They've understood certain hadith a certain way. Are you guys with me? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kullu musawirin finar. Every picture maker is in the fire. So everyone here that takes pictures. Huh? You can see where they're coming from, right? But the discussion revolves around what is actually considered a picture here in this hadith. It's going to take a long time to elaborate. I normally speak about it when I teach Kitab Tawheed. But anyways, shahid min al-kalam. Some of these brothers who were at this institute, they got accepted to go to university in Saudi Arabia. Jama'at al-Imam. I still remember it like it was yesterday. And they asked this brother to a Canadian well-known individual. And I was sitting there. You know what the question was? When we go to this university, we have these ID cards that has a picture. Wallahi al-Azim, guys. Guess what? They didn't go to the university. And one of the reasons was this. Or main reason was the picture that would be on the, on the ID. Ya jama'a. Even if you believe it to be haram. Let's say, according to you, it's haram. We'll go off of that. But you're in predicament now. All of the good that's going to come out of you going abroad to seek knowledge. Right? Should you now turn away from all of this good because of a picture on your ID, even if you see it to be haram? Ma'rifatu khayri al-khayrayni wa sharri sharrin. It's very, very important. Hmm. Now you have to judge the situation. You do it because there's more benefit that's going to come out of it and this predicament doesn't allow you to get rid of these evils or to prevent this evil that's actually taking place. Okay? So the brother basically asks, are you going to be held to account? 30% haram and then there's 70% that is good. What about the haram now that will come out of this situation? Right? Are you guys with me now? Does it make sense now to turn down all of this good of going to Riyadh and studying with the scholars and a university and you come out with a degree over this picture that's going to be on your ID? Let's just say that's what 5% and then 95% good that's going to come out of the situation. There's an example here that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions about his teacher Ibn Taymiyyah in his Kitab Alam al -Muqirin. He talks about, right, مررت أنا وبعض أصحابي في زمن التتار بقوم منهم يشربون الخمر فأنكر عليه من كان معي فأنكرت عليه وقلت له إنما حرم الله الخمر لأنها تصد عن ذكر الله وعن الصلاة وهؤلاء يصدهم الخمر عن قتل النفوس وسبي الذرية وأخذ الأموال فدعهم in the time of the Mongols right تتار where taking people's lives. Ibn Taymi was walking with some individuals and then they saw certain individuals who were drinking khamar. One of his companions, one of his companions wanted to forbid the evil that they were doing. Look how smart Ibn Taymi is, right? They're drinking khamar, which is haram. And when we see someone doing evil, should we stay quiet? You should try to address it in the best possible way. Right? You don't forbid the evil if it's going to lead to that which is worse. This is a very important principle that has been extrapolated from the Quran. 
So they were drinking khamar. And he said, you guys shouldn't be drinking khamar. Ibn Taymiyyah said to him, leave them. Let them drink khamar. Right? What does khamar do to an individual? What does it prevent him from? Salah, the remembrance of Allah and all that stuff, right? Ibn Taymiyyah is saying to him, khamar is stopping them from killing people. It's stopping them from stealing people's wealth. Leave them. Let them do as they wish. Right? To leave them drinking khamar, is it worse than them killing people? Which one's worse? Huh? Without a shadow of a doubt. You now enjoining the good. is good, sah? You enjoining the good and forbidding the evil is a maslaha. Sahih? It is a maslaha. However, if you do that, it might well potentially lead to that which is worse. Do you now do that, my brothers and my sisters? You have to weigh, right? The percentage of good that's going to come out of this situation and the percentage of evil. Does that make sense? No. Another scenario that I have here pertaining to boycotting people. Do you guys come across these scenarios where one is boycotting the other? Huh? And he stopped speaking to him. Hmm? Very common in certain circles, right? That which pertains to, for example, now an innovator. Should one be hanging around with an innovator that spreads poison and so on and so forth? Huh? The same is said about someone who's preaching false religions. And anyone who's evil, it's not just specific to an innovator. Anyone that you hang around with that is going to poison your mind, whether it is a feminist, whether it's a liberal, whether it is a secular, rest, whoever it might be, any person that is carrying with himself deviation, if you hanging around with him is going to pollute your mind and also affect your deen, should be you be hanging around with him. Naam. And the asal is that you stay far away from anyone like that, whether it's an innovator, whether it is a missionary for any of these other religions. Does that make sense? What you will see is some brothers coming across statements of the righteous predecessors. They will take it and then they will apply it on anyone that might be sitting with an innovator. That statement says, whoever you see hanging around or with an innovator, needs to be boycotted. Yes, the asal is, if that person is dangerous and is going to pollute your mind and affect your religion, you need to stay far away from him. That's with anyone. People always ask me now, I have these bad friends, bad company. Should I continue hanging around? Of course not. The asal is that you don't. However, is it bad and wrong in every single scenario? Should you be boycotting everyone that is maybe of what we have mentioned in every single case. Like for example now, I might be standing with a person that has these deviations for a number of reasons. There could be 101 reasons why I'm sitting with him. Am I wrong to say that? It could be that I'm advising him. It could be that I'm trying to say brainwash him. Huh? It could be that he's a family relative that has come and visited. And we happen to be sitting in the same room. Does that make sense? Do you boycott people unrestrictedly? Right? This is a very, very important topic. The reason why I'm going to bring it up because I see there's a lot of good in you people. And I'm sure a lot of you guys wants to go deeper into knowledge. And then sometimes when you start going deeper into knowledge and with the emergence of social media and all of the garbage that is spewed on there, you come across certain types of rhetoric that is being uttered by some, which may well be the reason why you end up thinking bad of others and perhaps even boycotting some of the closest people to you. Due to this narrow-minded way of looking at matters that are a lot more open than you think. Does that make sense? So now when it comes to boycotting, we mentioned, of course, any person of deviation, whether it's a Christian missionary, whether it's an innovator, a person of deviation, the asal is, is that you stay away from that person because it's going to affect your religion, right? Makes sense. 
However, is that in every single case now that you boycott that person? Ibn Abdul Bar, he says the following, brothers and sisters, this is very important. He says, وَلَا هِجْرَةَ إِلَّا لِمَنْ تَرْجُوا تَأْدِيبَهُ بِهَا أَوْ تَخَافُ مِنْ شَرِّهِ فِي بِدْعَةٍ أو غيرها. The only time when you boycott someone is if you boycotting him is going to discipline him. If it's not going to discipline him, then what's the point of boycotting? This is what he's saying. Or you are scared that he's going to affect you in your religion. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi talks about it as well. He says, وَهَذَا الْهَجْرُ يَخْتَلِفُ بِاخْتِلَافِ الْهَاجِرِينَ فِي قُوَّتِهِمْ وَضَعْفِهِمْ He goes, this boycotting that is carried out, it varies from person to person. Right? Also that which is taken into consideration is how strong and effective they are. فِي قُوَّتِهِمْ وَضَعْفِهِمْ Someone could be weak. And then he says, I'm going to boycott you. He'll just say, okay, I'll just go somewhere else. Are you guys with me? I'm going to boycott you. However, if there are a group of friends, 10 of them, all nine of them, they boycott him and he's going to feel alone because this is going to discipline him for the wrong that he's doing in that case. Should you do it? Perhaps, maybe it might be effective. Boycotting my brothers and my sisters is like a medicine. Right? It's like a medicine. If it's going to carry out a cure, only then you do it. If the benefits and the pros are going to outweigh the cons, then you do it. Otherwise, you don't. That's why he talks about وَقِلَّتِهِمْ وَكَثْرَتِهِمْ Also, if you're huge in number, right? And if you're not, maybe someone who has anyone around him. فَإِنَّ الْمَكْسُودَ بِهِ زَجْرُ الْمَهْجُورِ وَتَأْدِيبُهُ فَإِنَّ الْمَكْسُودَ بِهِ زَجْرُ الْمَهْجُورِ وَتَأْدِيبُهُ وَرُجُوعُ الْعَامَةِ عَنْ مِثْلِ حَالِهِ فَإِنْ كَانَتِ الْمَصْرَحَةُ بِذَلِكَ رَاجِحَةً بِحَيْثُ يُفْضِ هَجْرُهُ إِلَى ضَعْفِ الشَّرِّ وَخِفْيَتِهِ كَانَ مَشْرُوعًا If you now boycotting that individual is going to lessen his evil, in that case you do it. Right? However, وَإِنْ كَانَ لَا الْمَهْجُورُ وَلَا غَيْرُ يَرْتَدِعُ بِذَلِكَ بَلْ يَزِيدُ الشَّرِّ It could be that you boycott an individual, right? And it's only going to increase his evil. Do you do it in that case, my brothers and my sisters? You boycotted a person. You treated him a certain way. And this is only going to cause him now to what? Well, I remember there was a scenario, my brothers and my sisters, where a student of knowledge boycotted, and this individual now is very, very famous. If I mention his name, everyone's going to know who I'm talking about. And I used to tell the student of knowledge, don't boycott him. Don't do this. If you disagree with certain things that he has, fine. But to announce now that you're boycotting him, I honestly think this is going to lead to a big evil. But still, he boycotted him and he called him a whole load of names, thinking that maybe he's going to take heat. And wallahi, this brother just started making videos after videos after videos. Every time he would say, yes, that student of knowledge, this is what he done to me. And then people who are looking at this and watching it are thinking to themselves, are students of knowledge really... Students of knowledge, this is how they behave. Or people who are meant to be following the sunnah, this is how they behave. And it caused that person to just go further and further away. Does that make sense? Weighing up the pros and the cons. Because of the ramifications that might come out of it. He then goes on to say, بَلْ يَكُونُ التَّأْلِيفُ لِبَعْضِ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعَ مِنَ الْهَجَرِ Sometimes bringing that individual close and being nice to him and good to him, even though he might be a certain something or a way of thinking that he has that is problematic, sometimes keeping him close is better than actually boycotting him. Have you guys heard that statement before? It's called uh, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Perhaps if you keep him close, right, you can do what? Takhfif of his sharr. You can lessen his evil. As opposed to if you push him out and then he just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Hmm? Then he says, This is why the Prophet at times would boycott certain individuals and a lot of the time he would what? Keep close individuals. For example, why didn't the Messenger boycott the Munafiqeen altogether and start speaking about them 
publicly or maybe even fighting with them. Why didn't he do that? Huh? But on the other hand, he boycotted Ka'b ibn Malik and his two friends. It's mentioned in the Quran, وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ذَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ Why did he boycott these three righteous companions, but then the Munafiqin he didn't? Even one time, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Umar, leave them, right? We don't want the people to say that Muhammad is killing his own companions. Because the Munafiqun, they used to act like they're the companions, right? And now if you kill them or you do anything to them, it's going to spread around the people or to the other tribes outside of Al-Madinah that this is what Muhammad does to his people. And because of that, he didn't. Because of the cons that would come out of the situation that outweighed the pros by a lot. You guys with me? Even there was a situation, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Imam al-Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi chapter this by saying, Bab, man taraka ba'd al-ikhtiyar makhafatan yaqsur ala fahmi ba'd al-nasi fa yaqa'u fi ashad min. Whoever now leaves off doing certain things because if he was to do it, it would cause the people to misunderstand that situation. Simply because they just, you know, they can't comprehend it. What was the evidence for this tabweeb? One time the Messenger was sitting with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and he said to her, Ya Aisha, لَوْلَا قَوْمُكِ حَدِيثُ عَهْدٍ بِكُفْرُ لَنَقَدْتُ الْكَعْبَةُ وَجَعَلْتُ الْعُبَابَيْنِ you know when you go to the Kaaba now, can you enter inside of the Kaaba? Is it possible not for us to go inside of the Kaaba? Huh? Huh? We can't. You need stairs to get in, right? You need stairs to get into the Kaaba. Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, right, if it wasn't for your people being new to Al-Islam, I would have demolished the Kaaba and then rebuilt it. And I would have what? Put two doors. A door that you can enter from and a door that you can exit from. Are you guys with me? But he didn't do it. Why didn't he do it? Quraysh, they spent their money in building the Kaaba, right? And now this guy he comes along and then what? He demolishes the Kaaba? Imagine now how this would make them think. And it might well even be the reason that they end up apostating. Looking at the ramifications and the implications of our actions is something that is very, very important. We don't just rush into doing things head first. Take a moment out to think about the ramifications of your actions and what it could actually lead to. Right? Even Ibn Taymiyyah somewhere else, it says, فَإِذَا لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي هُجْرَانِهِ إِنْ زِيْجَارَ أَحَدٍ وَلَا انْتِهَاءَ أَحَدٍ بَلْ بُطْلَانُ كَثِيرٌ مِنَ الْحَسَنَاتِ الْمَأْمُورِ بِهَا لَمْ تَكُنْ هِجْرَةٌ مَأْمُورًا بِهَا كَمَا ذَكَرَهُ أَحْمَدُ عَنْ أَهْلِ خُرَسَانِ If you boycotting others, it's not going to discipline them. It's not going to stop whatever they're doing. But rather, so much good is going to go down the drain. Right? That you have been commanded with. In this case, you do not boycott. Just like what Imam Ahmed said about the people of Khurasan. أَنَّهُمْ لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَقْوُونَ بِالْجَهْمِيَّةِ أَيْ لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ أَنْ يُظْهِرُوا الْعَدَاوَةِ لِلْجَهْمِيَّةِ Jami is one of those, you know, ancient groups that used to have problematic beliefs. However, he's saying the people of Khurasan, they didn't have the ability to boycott them. They just didn't have the strength. And this is why they didn't do it. فَإِذَا عَجَزُوا عَنِ الْهَارِ الْعَدَاوَةِ سَقَطَ الْأَمْرُ بِفِعْلِ هَذِي الْحَسَنَةِ Right. I'll give you guys another example. I think it's worth mentioning, right? In Leicester, did you guys hear about the protests that were taking place? Huh? The Hindutva and that, yeah? Me personally, my brothers and my sisters, you will never find me protesting or going outside to these rallies. I'm not going to ever do that. Right? And I know there are different views on it. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, rahmatullahi alayhi, he talks about protesting in the West. If that's the only way you can acquire your rights, then you're allowed to do it. But generally speaking, it's not allowed. I don't want to go into all of that. But I personally wouldn't do it. Let's just say, right? This is haram, right? However, 
reason why I'm going out is to prevent a big evil. One time I found myself in this predicament. There was a poster that was released. All of the Muslims get together on this road. This, on this road is where a lot of the, uh, the Hindutva lived. Right? You guys heard of it, right? When the, there was a lot of clashes taking place in Leicester, it was all over the news and whatever have you. So this flyer was released telling the Muslims that they should all go to this road. Wallahi, I honestly believe a Muslim did not create this poster. It was something that was created in order to catch out the Muslims. Right? So generally speaking, like I said, I wouldn't go to these protests, but I decided to go there just so I could grab the mic. You know who was there? As soon as we arrived, every single media outlet you can think of with their big cameras. And you have also Muslims that have what? Baliklawas? Is that what you call it? Baliklawa. And they want to do something that is maybe going to make Islam look really bad. And then you also have the police, right? Blocking the whole road. The Muslims are shouting, saying, we're going to run through the police. And guess who's there? The cameraman. Waiting for an opportunity to record the Muslims so they can use that against Islam. And that's why I went. I grabbed the mic. I was like, yeah, jama'ah. If any of you Muslims do anything right now and you push yourself through the police, all of these news outlets, all of the mainstream media is going to shoot you and then put it on the internet. Do you guys want to make Islam look bad? Can you guys see the predicament they're in? What do you do here? They were like, we are here because our women are being humiliated. They're being attacked. And today, we want to show them that we are... All that. I can understand where they're coming from. But what do you do now? The police is blocking the whole road. And you've got the media outside. They're ready to record everything that the Muslims are going to be doing. And then they're going to what? Name it. Muslims did this. So I grabbed the mic. I was like, please, brothers, go home. When I explained to them this qa'id al huh? outside, grabbed the mic, and I'm shouting from the top of my lungs. Wallahi, they all went. Are you brothers and sisters with me? Assessing the situation, lesser of the two evils. It may have been bad for me to go there, but... I could see that more good is going to come out of the situation than bad. Are you guys with me? Because this was a very hot thing at, this, at the time. It was scary times, honestly. Sheikh, we're going to finish at five. Is that right, Uncle Ahmed? No, Sheikh, don't worry about me. I said to them, I'm ready to stay here to Fajr. I'm even happy to cancel the next program, Sheikh, just so we can stay here because I'm really enjoying myself going through a lesson. I'm tired of lectures. Lectures, my brothers and my sisters, are like painkillers. You guys know what a painkiller is? Does it treat your underlining issue? No, it doesn't. A lot of us, we need an operation, and that's what a lesson is. Operation, huh? That's going to treat the underlining issue. A lot of us are in need of that. And this is what our lessons are for. I have another example, my brothers and my sisters here. Generally speaking, are you allowed to go to the churches? Just to go to the church and then sit there on the days of celebration? Okay, on the Eid, like on the Eid. Should you just go to the, you know, church and, and kick back, you know? And, huh? Should you? Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he would say, لا تدخل لا تدخلوا على المشركين في كنائسهم يوم عيدهم فإن السخطة أو فإن سخط الله تنزل عليهم. Don't go to their churches on the days of celebration because the anger of Allah as though it is coming down upon them. Umar ibn Khattab said this. However, you get an invite from the local pastor to come over and to give a speech about Islam. Huh? To give a speech about al Islam, God is predicament. Should you go? Hi, Jama'ah. You're in this predicament now. This case that we're taking, there is some good 
And there's also some bad that you have to deal with is a predicament. Yes, you should. Providing certain conditions are met. Even the legend, they were asked this, right? They said, If this is now an opportunity now to bring them closer to Islam, and you're not going to be participating in their rituals, in the acts of worship. And you're not going to become influenced and affected by their beliefs and their way of thinking, then go, do it. Because the good is going to, inshallah ta'ala, outweigh the bad. Does that make sense? Me? Not yet. But I would if they asked me. Huh? I would love to do that. It's an opportunity. Hmm. Oh, you mean recently? Uh, he went to Hajj, right? Uh, he's talking about the brother that recently went to Hajj. He was a pastor. And then he converted to Al-Islam. He went back into the church to give them da'wah and they all embraced Al-Islam. Right? So, especially if there's a high possibility that you could have some sort of influence and impact. Here, this is another example where you're in a predicament some good is going to come out of it and then maybe there's some bad. But the good outweighs the bad. What do you do? Do you just khalas? Right? Dismiss this whole scenario? No, not at all. Did you buy me my Tim Hortons? Huh? I'm joking. I'm joking. I don't drink coffee. I don't drink coffee, guys. Is, is coffee halal? Yeah. Huh? I have doubts whether it is, yeah, Sheikh. <laughs> when I went to Australia, my driver was high on caffeine, right? He was hooked on. He can't drive unless he has what? Coffee. I said to him, Wallahi, I'm unsure whether ha- coffee is actually halal for you. Because he can't function without coffee. He goes, I'll get into an accident. He has to stop the car. I've never drank coffee. Man. Alhamdulillah, Allah afani. Allah saved me from it. طيب, this next one, my brothers and my sisters. Saying ameen aloud at the end of Fatiha. Is that a sunnah? It's a sunnah, right? Also raising your hands in the salah. Is that a sunnah? حديث عبد الله بن عمر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يرفع يدي حذب من كبه إذا افتتح الصلاة وإذا كبر للركوع وإذا رفع رأسه من الركوع. Four times you can raise your hand according to this hadith عبد الله بن عمر. الشيخ عبد العزيز بن باز he was asked and I'm just using this as an example right under this point. Is it allowed for someone now to leave off doing certain sunnah acts like this one, right? If he fears a bigger fitna will come out of it. Because these debates all the time, huh? If a bigger fitna is actually going to come out of this. He says, if you are now amongst the people, they don't raise their hands in the salah, they don't do raf al and they don't say ameen aloud. It is better that you don't do that simply because you can bring their hearts closer. Well, in some messages, guys, if you say ameen aloud, there's going to be an uproar after the salah. Simply because they just don't understand. That's a sunnah. So don't cause a fitna. And some shabab, young people, very passionate, he just learned that, you know, you say ameen aloud. Ameen. It's the longest ameen that he's ever done. Huh? Right? Fi dakhil salah and then after the salah is what? Chaos. So Sheikh Ibn Baz is saying, فَالْأَوْلَى يَفْعَلَ ذَلِكَ is better that you don't do it. Especially my brothers and my sisters, right? If you're going to a masjid, you want to do certain sunan, right? Yes, this is maybe something that they're not doing, but there is a bigger problem that you need to deal with. Like for example, they have deviated beliefs. Right? Wallahi, some people think the moment you start, you know, doing this inside of your prayer, that this is now the first step of extremism. My son is going to go and join ISIS. Wallahi, parents said that to me. They actually thought that. Just no, no. Yes, we know it's a sunnah. We know also that if you leave it off, your salah is not going to be invalid. However, ta'leefan liqulubihim. Up until when he says in this fatwa, my brothers and my sisters, he says, وَإِن كَانَ الصَّوَابُ أَنَّهُ يُسْتَحَبُّ الْجَهْرُ بِالْتَأْمِينَ Even though we know that the correct view is that it's sunnah, 
to raise your voice with Ameen and to raise your hands, right? It's a sunnah. Hadith Abdullah ibn Umar is in Bukhari. وَيَكُونُ قَدْ تَرَكَ أَمْرًا مُسْتَحَبًّا فَلَا يَفْعَلُ مُؤْمِنٌ مُسْتَحَبًّا يُفْضِي إِلَى انْشِقَاقٍ وَخِلَافٍ وَفِثْنًا One doesn't do a sunnah if it's now going to leave it, right, to inshiqaq, to, you know, disunity, and it's going to cause what? A split, right, or a fitna. بَلْ يَتْرُكُ الْمُؤْمِنُ الْمُسْتَحَبَّ إِذَا كَانَ يَتَرَتَّبُ عَلَى تَرْكِهِ مَصَالِحَ عَظَمْ The believer, he leaves of something that is sunnah, right? Especially if now this revolves around him leaving something off because there is a bigger benefit that he's trying to acquire. Did everyone, come, did everyone get that? We've come across these discussions, huh? these debates, right? And then he gives the example of the Kaaba that I mentioned earlier. When the Messenger وسلم, did not demolish the Kaaba because of, uh, because of what? Because of the fear of them misunderstanding what he's doing. Hmm. Let me ask you guys another question. Arguing with, or debating, should I say, with the mushriks, is that allowed? Huh? You know what I find, Ajib? Some people, they will say, you're not allowed to debate with the innovator, but you're allowed to debate with the... Huh? You're allowed to debate with the mushrikin. And people will get bashed for it and whatever. And again, this is the asal is that you stay away from these kind of discussions. However, there might be exceptions where you have to go and do that. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He allowed it. He said, um, وَلَا تُجَادُوا لَهَا الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هي أحسن. Don't debate with the people of the book except if it's done properly. إِلَّا بِالَّتِي أَحْسَن أَوْ أُدْعُوا إِلَى سَبِيلَ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِدَةِ الْحَدْنِ وَجَادِلُوا بِالَّتِي No, argue with them and debate with them in the best possible way. Are your brothers with me? وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي أَحْسَن طيب, is that for everyone? Is Allah here speaking to everyone about this? No. Only if you believe that more benefit is going to come out of this situation than what? Than harm. If you're not equipped with the tools now to repel these doubts, do you do it? If you are going to get influenced and maybe affected by this way of thinking, should you go and do it? No. And the same goes now when you're debating with the innovator. Sometimes you think that you are smart and you're intelligent and you have the knowledge. Not everyone that has knowledge should be debating. Because there are the slick debate tactics that ignorant people have and they'll wipe the floor with you even though he has no knowledge. Right? We only do it if the benefits are going to outweigh the cons. Type that which relates to taking riba with your life on the line or your son's life is on the line. Mm. This is a bit of a very controversial topic. Am I allowed to take an interest-based loan simply because the life of my son is on the line or my life is on the line or my mother's life is on the line? Hmm? I'm not saying that this is my view, my brothers and my sisters, but I brought this as an example because it is a valid view out there. Sheikh Abdurrahman Rahman Nasr al-Barraq and other than him as well. He says, إِذَا كَانَ هَذَا الْعِلَاجُ Right? مَقْطُوعٌ بِإِنْفَاذِهِ or بِإِنْقَاذِهِ, sorry. You now buying this medicine, it is like almost 100% sure that it is going to save this individual's life. You know, sometimes there's a possibility of huh? He might get saved, he might not. We're talking about is very highly likely. Because we've seen it. Save other people's lives. Bifadlillahi wa bi'idhni. Sayunqidhuna hayatahu bihada wa annahu idha lam yaf'alhu mat. And if he doesn't, buy this ilaj, this medicine, and he's going to die. Fana'am kal akli min al mayta. It is like eating from a dead animal. It is a darora. Amma idha kana, right? Ilajiyan, 
ناحية علاجية يمكن ويمكن like I mentioned it's possible maybe maybe فلا يجوز الأخذ in that case no you're not allowed to take الربا right. there are other scholars they say no even if you're going to die then don't because it's a war with Allah and then it's this and this I'm not giving you guys a fatwa this is a valid view out there when I read this fatwa I thought okay this is a good example now to mention under this legal maxim didn't we say that we're going to fill our lesson today with practical contemporary examples this is what I love to do in usul al-fiqh and like al even Abu Abdullah al-Zarkashi said فَالضَّرُورَ بُلُوغُهُ حَدًّا إِنْ لَمْ يَتَنَاوَلْ الْمَمْنُوعَ هَلَكْ أَوْ قَارَبْ هُوَ كَالْمُضْطَرِّ لِلْأَكْلِ right he is like the one who you know when you're traveling you're in the middle of a desert and you're going to die and the only thing in front of you is what? pig swine can you eat the pig? how much of the pig do you eat? until alhamdulillah babs he enjoys it I've never had pig in my life this is the opportunity now you know to really enjoy it huh? لا الضرورات تقدر بقدرها you take from the necessity that which is going to cover your need خلاص you don't eat it or consume it till you end up burping guys that could it's going to cover my need and I keep it moving does that make sense? and that's with any darura necessity and a necessity my brothers and my sisters is when your life is on the line and also maybe because your body parts are in danger in that case you're allowed to do haram daruratan out of necessity does that make sense? طيب the next legal maxim and then we're going to have to finish we're going to finish on YouTube I think that's a sign that he really enjoyed the class huh? do you guys benefit from the legal maxim today? should we cancel the second lesson? second class? huh? Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go through five Quranic verses that will help us navigate and maneuver around modern day ideologies and doubts. It's ilmi, but inshallah everybody can benefit from it. It's not just for students of knowledge, for everyone. Alhamdulillah, we had some sisters move away from feminism, some of the other programs that we've done, and cover some of the schisms and the isms and the colors. Let me ask you guys a question. Right? Don't you think sometimes keeping quiet when it comes to our morals and values actually has a negative lasting impact on the community? The haqq or the truth dies down? Hmm? So it's important that we discuss it, right? In a manner that is not going to get anyone into trouble. I'm still stunning, guys. And a lot of my videos online, they're very colorful. Sahih? Because we always put the disclaimers at the beginning. If a lot of us actually spoke to our solicitors and lawyers and how to maybe maneuver around these things, we'll find a way. Right? Type the next one, my brothers and my sisters, Al-Adatu Muhakkama. Don't worry, I don't think it's going to start five say anyway. Huh? With the amount of people that need to get in, that's just opening time. Walala, ya Adam. Huh? He said, Allahu A'lam. <laughs> Our people are never on time. <laughs> Type the next leading legal maxim. Al-Adatu Muhakkama. العادة محكمة Norms Customs Are authoritative Norms Slash customs However you want to translate it Or traditions Should I say right? These are all synonyms In this context It is authoritative did Islam come to remove people's norms and their traditions and their customs? As I mentioned earlier, لا. In fact, the asal 
of our norms and our customs is that it is permissible until proven otherwise. Such as, if I mention an example, the poet he says, "Wal asr fi adatina al-ibaha hatta yajiya sarif al-ibaha." The asal, the base origin of our norms, traditions, and customs is that it is permissible until proven otherwise. Sahih. A very nice Somali custom is, you know when you go to the house and you finished eating, you don't go to the bathroom to wash your hands. They bring you a bakhuri. That's what they call it, right? Huh? A bowl that has shampoo in it. So you wash your hand and they bring you another one and you wash it. Are you Somali? Well, am I right? Is there anything wrong with that? No. I think in uh, Pakistani culture, they have something called, um, correct me if I'm wrong guys, huh? any Pakistanis here? Huh. These sisters, the, the, the girl side, they have these get-togethers, like six, seven of them, get-togethers before the wedding, girls get together. Okay? What's it called? So I'm not waffling, huh? You're, it's right, say. Hey? I want the Pakistanis to comment in the comment section and say that I'm oppressing them. Right? He's a witness. Is there anything wrong with these norms? Right? The asal is that norms are fine until we have an evidence that says that this is haram. A very bad, evil norm is. What they say to you, she's your cousin. Don't worry. Go upstairs and watch a movie with her. Or just mingle with her. Adi, ma fi mushkila. Stop making a big deal out of it. Is it okay just because she's my cousin? They even added to it, cousin, sister. Cousin, sister. Isn't that what they say? Cousin, sister. To downplay and dilute the seriousness of this matter. Can I just be chilling, me and my cousin, sister, and having a chat, tea, innocent chit chats, or we play FIFA together, me and her? That's right. We go upstairs and we're watching a movie. Is it allowed? Is she actually my sister? With my sister, I can do that. Am I Jews? Never does a man seclude himself with a woman except that the third is what? Shaitan. I received the case. They let their guard down. They were just intermingling with one another. The cousin was a junkie. He was a drug addict. And then he ended up committing a zina with a girl who was his cousin sister. This left the family so broken that they had to send her to the Emirates. And she... I think up until this very moment, she's still there. Imagine that what that would do to a family. Two cousins. Right? Two cousins, guys. And they, even if, you know, this idea that sometimes comes to people's minds, okay, let's just get them married off to with one another. Even the girl's family think, okay, the guy's a junkie. Right? Isn't this what they do sometimes, you know, when Zina happens and she gets impregnated, oh, let's just try and, you know, conceal it and get them married off. Even that, I like thinking, oh, the guy's a junkie. The scholars they discuss what's the difference between Ada and likewise Al Urf. But, anyways, Ada, my brothers and my sisters, is Ma'tad al Nasu alayhi. Is that which the people have become used to and accustomed to? That which they do regularly. What is something that happens repeatedly, right? Sawan kana. It could be that is a norm for a certain individual that he has or something that is right concerning a number of people or a group of people and so on and so forth. There are conditions in order for us to accept these norms. Number one. لا يكون العرف مخالفا للشرع This عرف this norm or this custom, this tradition doesn't go against the Sharia. That's the first condition. And we just gave some examples. The second one, my brothers and my sisters, in order for it to be considered a norm, أن يكون مطردا. This is why they have a qaida, إنما تعتبر العادة إذا إذا طردت أو غلبت. Right? A norm that is widely accepted as a customary practice. We're not talking about exemptions or exceptional, right, things that people hold as norms. No, we're talking about the general norm here is that we do X, Y, and Z. Here in Canada, my brothers and my sisters, when you go to the shop and you buy something that you can't actually carry with you, 
The burden is upon who to actually take it. The shop to deliver it or for you to take it? Shop, they normally just drop it off, right? It's a norm. Right? Very well known here. I've just walked into a shop. I'm going to take these shelves. Should I be taking it or should he be dropping it off? In some places, the norm is that he should be what? Dropping it off. And in other places, it could be the opposite. But we're talking about certain norms that have become customarily practiced. Third condition, my brothers and my sisters. There might be a certain norm, a certain customary practice, like the one that I just mentioned. In some countries, when you go and buy something that is heavy, he has to go and what? Drop it off to your house. Or he has to now carry it to your car. He has to go and carry it to your car. They might start arguing. No, I don't want to do it. No, he goes, you have to do it. This is our customs. This is when it comes in handy, especially when there are arguments and conflicts. Does that make sense here? You might not find a delil, a hadith from the Quran, uh, a verse from the Quran and a hadith from the Sunnah that says, whoever buys something, then it's upon that someone that has bought that thing not to carry it to the car or is upon the seller now to carry it. No, you, you don't find that. Does that make sense? So here the third condition is, there might be a certain norm. However, they stipulate in the agreement that we're going to do the opposite. In that case, you have to honor it if you agree. Everyone get that? So he buys something from this guy now and he says, listen, I know the norm is X, Y, and Z, but I don't want to do it. We want to do the opposite. If he agrees, you have to what? Fulfill it and honor it. And number four, my brothers and my sisters, أن يكون سابقا ومقارنا لما أريد تحكيمه به فلا عبرة بالعرف الحادث الطارئ. Pay attention guys now, right? There was a certain customary practice that was acted upon for the last 30 years. However, for some reason, now the urf has changed. The customs of the people has changed now, 30 years down the line. Agreements were made in these previous 30 years based on a certain customarily practice. Are you guys with me? Now that we have a new norm, are we going to now, right, dismiss all of these agreements that happened in the past because of a new norm that has come about? No. Did everyone get that? Because norms change, right? As time goes on, it starts changing. So there was an agreement that was made in the past based on a certain norm. Now that it's changed, are we going to say, oh, that agreement doesn't stand anymore because our norms have changed? La, you can't just what, dissolve it. When does it come in extremely handy acting upon norms? The poet, he says, وَالْعُرْفُ مَعْمُولٌ بِهِ ذَا وَرَدْ حُكْمٌ مِنَ الشَّرْعِ الشَّرِيفِ لَمْ يحد. It becomes authoritative, urf, it becomes authoritative. Your norms and your customary practices and your traditions become authoritative if there is no nas. There's no specific evidence that specifies these issues in a certain way. I'll give you guys an example. Allah says in the Quran, no, no, I'm going to mention this after. Prophet ﷺ says, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْ يُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَهِ Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, he should honor his guests. So our brother Adam has been honoring us, his guests. He should what? Honor his guests. Taib, did Allah or his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mention exactly how you need to honor your guests? How much you need to buy of meat or chicken or whatever? How do you honor him? It varies from tradition to tradition or culture to culture, sah? Sahih? And from time to time and place to place. Agreed? It hasn't been specified when the Messenger Sallallahu said, honor your guests. I remember one of the Shaykh said this, right? And then I repeated it to my teacher when I, when I was studying this in Al-Madinah. I was like, Shaykh, what do you think of this? And he started, the whole class burst in laughter. I was like, yeah, Shaykh, would it be correct to say that from the ways of honoring your guests is the moment he walks into your house, you give him the Wi-Fi password. Giving him the Wi-Fi password. This is one of the ways to honor your guest. As soon as he arrives, he just traveled from another country. A lot of the time do they have a 
SIM card. Up until now, I don't have a SIM card. I've just been, you know, hot spying the brothers. So as soon as he arrives into the house, one of the first things that you do is you give him the Wi-Fi password. Do you guys agree with me? Sahih? Because he's got messages to get back to. He's just been traveling for eight, nine hours. One of the ways. Hmm? Allah told you to honor your guest. The Messiah told you to honor the guest. It's a way of honoring the guest. So it varies from place to place and time to time. Another example, my brothers and my sisters, is when Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَإِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَخْصُرُوا مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ إِنْ خِفْتُمْ يَفْتِنِكُمْ لِذِيكَ Once you hit the road, there's no harm upon you to shorten your salah. This is a long discussion, deep discussion that the shiuch, the scholars and the students of knowledge, they have amongst themselves. How far does the trip need to be, or this safar, this travel needs to be, in order for you to be allowed to shorten your salah? Huh? How much? He said 80 kilometers. That's according to who? Imam Shafi'i and also Imam Ahmed. He's a Shafi'i and Hanbali physician. I'm a Hanbali, guys. However, when we came to this issue, the narrations that they relied upon were statements of the companions. However, it looked very contradictory. So other scholars, they said, listen, we, there isn't anything substantial that we can rely on when specifying the distance that you could shorten your prayers for. Allah told you to shorten once you hit the road, but how many or how far does it need to be before you're allowed to shorten? So there is a second strong opinion where they said it goes back to the norms and the customs of the people. Let me ask you guys a question. From North London to South London, is that considered travel by the people of London? Do you guys, what do you guys think? No, it's not. Even though it's two hours. To get from North London to South London, it might even take you about two hours. I hate driving in London. Every time I'm driving towards London, I dread those moments. Is it considered travel? And when you went there, it takes a long time, right, to get from one side to another. But from Montreal to Ottawa, it took us something like two hours. Is it considered travel by the people of Canada? Are you allowed to shorten your prayers in this scenario? Yes, you are. Allah told you to shorten, but he didn't specify. So this is when customs and traditions and norms come into practice, my brothers and my sisters. You guys get the gist now. We're going to go on for another 10 minutes and then we're done. Trust me, guys. I don't think these guys are going to start till 6 o'clock. Huh? You got enough memory? Alhamdulillah. You guys came prepared to that question? Okay, type. Let me give you guys uh, some examples, inshallah ta'ala, right? I ask Adam, I entrust him now to go and buy me a car. I tell him, buy me a car. That's all I say. Pay attention to my wording. I ask Adam to go and buy me a car. Adam goes and buys me a faulty car and says, hey, you asked me to buy your car. Here's the car. Now me and him are arguing. How can you go and buy me a faulty? He goes, you said to me, buy me a car. Who's right and who's wrong here? What we see as authoritative here is Al-Urf. Yes, Islam says that you can entrust people to go and buy things for you. Right? However, the Urf, you can maybe even call this common sense. Right? That which is commonly practiced upon them. When they ask you to go and buy something, you buy that which is what? Not faulty. Sahih? And he goes, you told me to buy a car, so I bought your car. Yeah, I knew it was faulty, but you told me your car, and it doesn't make sense here. Urf comes in handy. Does that make sense? I'll give you guys another example, right? Does anyone here have a Tesla? Tesla? They have Mercedes? C-Class? D-Class? E-Class? Anyone got Mercedes here? But what cars do you guys drive? Huh? Okay, our brother said he has a, he has a Mazda. How big is it? Seven-seater, four-seater? Four-seater. 
He borrows me his car, his four-seater Mazda. I used to have a Mazda once upon a time. It's a small car. What do I decide to do? I decide to take this Mazda car now to the mountains in Calgary. I start driving on the mountains. <laughs> and then I come back to him. He goes, where did you go? I said to him, I drove your car over the mountains, up into the hills. And then he looks at his mesquite car. Huh? He says, what are you doing? Right? He said, and then I turn around to him and I say, Achi, you allowed me to borrow your car? He said, I could borrow your car, right? So I borrowed it. When you borrow someone a car, are you expecting him to drive on the mountains, my brothers and my sisters? To take it onto the hills, huh? Damaging it long term. It might not necessarily be damaged there and then, but you could see that the toll that he has on the car. So, hey, who's wrong here? Me. For going against norms that are authoritative in situations when it might not necessarily have been specified. I like this example that I'm going to share. When we was in Medina, of course, every day we would go from the university to the university to the haram. Does anyone know how much it costs to get to the haram when you're filling up by car? You know? Three riyal, ahsant. Have, have you been to, you study Medina? Yeah, three riyals, which is maybe, I think, how much in Canadian dollars? How many cents? One dollar. One dollar. So every time after, or before Asr, because everyone wants to get there for Asr time, right? All the students, they go towards the cars, they don't even speak to the driver, everyone just goes in. Because everyone knows the price. Right? And then he drives off, then you drop him your three riyals, and then khalas, you go to the haram. There was a few cases where I was in the car, we entered into the car, we didn't even speak to him, because it's just something that has been commonly practiced. This is what they do every day. All of the drivers, all of the taxis. We got to the haram, and then the driver says, everyone pay five riyals. <laughs> Some of the Algerians in the car, they were about to, you know, knock his head off, akhi. Huh? And they got really angry. What do you mean five riyals? He goes, no, I charge five riyals. And I said to him, the line of poetry. Here the commonly practiced norm is what? Three riyals. Don't go against our customs. Don't go against our norms. Three riyals. When I said that to him, I paid three riyals and I went to scoff. Right? Type. My neighbor, he sends over food with plates. You know the plates that you buy from Walmart? Is that how you say it? Walmart. We don't have Walmart in the... You know plates that you buy? Walmart, right? They serve food. They gift you the food, right? I look at these, you know, plates and think, oh, mashallah, looks good. New plates for my cupboard. Huh? Is that how it is? What's the norm here? Even though he gave me a gift, the gift was what? The food, right? And if you give a gift, you don't ask for it back. And the food was packaged with the lovely plates from Walmart and took it. He goes, no, oh, nice. And then he puts it in the cupboard. Your neighbor comes knocking a couple of days later, can I have my place? He goes, no, 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 no. You gifted to me? Ana wa hadiyati. Me and my gift. Khalas. Yasruh. What is the ada here? What is the norm, my brothers and my sisters here? That you always return back these plates. Tell you, what about if they were plastic plates? Do I need to return back the plastic plates? Can my neighbor say, listen, I gave you food, give me back my plastic plates. Ayah, Sheikh. The norm is what here? Now plastic plates that you put in the bin. No one asks you for plastic plates. Taib. I sell something to you for a thousand. I say to you, I'll give it to you for a thousand. Dollars, right? Thousand Canadian dollars. Sorry. Naam. 
I sell you. Listen, I want a thousand for this. I want a thousand. Mm, let me reword it. Okay. I have a car that I want to get rid of. I send him on WhatsApp 1,000. We're in Canada here. Canada, huh? He says, how much is it? 1,000. When the time of dealing with this comes, right? Or the transaction arrives. Instead of giving me 1,000 Canadian dollars, he gives me 1,000 rupees. Ya Salah, which one do we go off with? Akhi, the norm is 1,000 Canadian dollars. 1,000 hmm? Canadian dollars. Another example, my brothers and my sisters, is I sell you something and we agree on a Canadian dollars, right? On a certain amount. And at the time of making the exchange, instead of giving me 1,000 Canadian dollars, I give him the same amount in pounds. And he says, no, I'm not accepting. because goes, this is the exact same amount. He goes, no, I don't want it. And that is because the umlah, the currency that is dealt with here is what? Canadian dollars. Right? You can't just turn around and say, listen, I'm going to go and give him whatever I want. Five, I rented you a house. And in this house, you start bringing over guests and relatives and family, right? And then me who rented you the house, I turn around to you and I say, Akhi, what are you doing, Akhi? I only rented this house to you. How do we deal with this situation? Who's right and who's wrong here? When I rent out the house, would you agree that the customary practice is that I'm allowed to invite into this house whoever I want? Do I need to say on the contract, just to let you know, my mother lives in another country and I'm going to what, bring her over and you need to allow me to do so, otherwise I'm not... Do I need to go into one of that, guys? Are you guys with me? How long do I have? Just let me know exactly the time. You got two minutes? Did everyone get that? However, if I start throwing a party, huh? If I start throwing a party and I'm making a lot of noise and turning my house into a disco, and he says, no, you can't do that. Does he have a point? Does he have a right to say that to me? The guy who rented me the house? Of course. Because the house is not used for that. It's not used for a disco. This is also when what? It comes in handy. I've got one minute. I'm just going to rush through this very, very quickly. Can you give me two minutes, three minutes? Yeah, cameraman. Two, three minutes, yeah? Please. The fourth leading legal maxim, my brothers and my sisters, is what? Huh? Al-umuru bi maqasidiha. Matters are judged by their intentions. Right? Matters are judged by their intentions. Earlier, I touched on it. Someone had a shotgun with him and he was in the forest. The guy carrying the shotgun went with a couple of his relatives. And he was trying to what? Hunt down some animals. But he ended up killing one of his relatives. He ended up killing one of his relatives. This leading legal maxim that has been derived and extrapolated from where? Al-umuru bi innama al-a'malu bin niyat. The hadith that everyone's memorized. Likewise, also, I forgot to mention the previous one, al-darar yuzal. It has been extrapolated from a hadith called la darar wa la dirar. Not causing harm and reciprocating harm. Does that make sense? Here, al-umuru bi maqasid la take innama al-a'malu bin niyat. What determines here, or how do we judge the situation? Right? When passing the judgment of him either being an intentional murderer or someone who has committed manslaughter. Which one is it? Was it manslaughter or was it murder? A lot of the time in these cases it is manslaughter. Because he went hunting. They were all going to go hunting but they ended up shooting him. The intentions play a part here. Does that make sense? Taib, I gave... Brother Farhan, back to Farhan. Huh? Some money. Because he was going through a lot of trouble. He was going through a lot of trouble. Right? Paying back some of his debts. And these people are giving him a hard time. I came along, $5,000, I paid for it. One week later, I come back to Farhan. And I say to him, I can have my 5000 He says to me, wasn't that a gift? Huh? Wasn't that a gift? 
Here we go back to the intention. We ask the one who paid. Was it done out of a gift? Was it done because you were trying to pay sadaqah? Was it done because he was trying to zakat, whatever? Right? Was it alone? Does that make sense? The intention comes in handy. And then the last leading legal maxim, my brothers and my sisters, al mashaqqatu tajribu taysir. With hardship, it facilitates what? Ease. Right? When things get really, really hard, the sharia doesn't continue making it hard upon you. Where did we take this from? When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, ما أمرتكم به فأتوا منه ما استطعتم Anything that I have commanded you with, then try to do it to the best of your ability. فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم Fear Allah to the best of your ability. Does that make sense? Right? If you have now a problem with your leg and you have to sit down in the salah, the sharia makes it easy for you. You can't fast because of a sickness. The sharia makes it easy if you can make it up later. However, we do need to elaborate on this, but the cameraman needs to go. Right? It's not just unrestricted like that. Oh, I feel some hardship, then I'm going to go and do haram. No, it has to be within the parameters of the religion. Because we you know when you come to the West, everything becomes maslaha, maslaha. Well, it's easy. No, there are boundaries, there are parameters. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? Right? What I always do at the end, my brothers and my sisters, I take a moment out to thank my teachers because whatever I related to you was from my teachers. Right? The poet he says, Imam Sa'di, and he mentioned in Qawaid al Fikhiya, Wahadihi Qawaid al Nazam to Hamin Kutbi Ahlil Ilm, Kat Hasalta, Jazahum al Mawla Azim al Ajri. He begins to make dua for them. That Allah rewards them with good and excellence. And he makes dua that Allah pardons them. And this is how we should be. Those who benefited me immensely in Qawaid al Fiqhiya, none other than Sheikh Suleiman al Ruhayli. Likewise, Sheikh Abdullah Shanqiti, one of my teachers in the university, and other books that I benefited from. Likewise, Sheikh Saleh Sindi. Shaykh Salih al usaymi and other than him, poet he says, إِذَا فَادَكِ إِنسَانٌ بِفَائِدَةٍ مِنَ الْعُلُومِ فَلَازِمْ شُكْرَهُ أَبَدًا Anyone who benefits, you always be thankful, even if it is one benefit that you took from him. It could be your classmate that gave you that benefit. وَأَلْقِ الْكِبَرَ وَالْحَسَدًا Get rid of your kibir, get rid of your hasad, your arrogance and likewise your envy. And may Allah protect us from those who are mentioned in that line of poetry. وَعَلِّمُهُ الرِّمَايَةَ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ Every day I teach him archery. The moment he was able to shoot, the first person that he shot at was his teacher. The teacher was teaching him every day how to put lines of poetry together. You know, back in the day, you know how you guys have here diss tracks? They had poetry tracks or diss poetry, whatever you want to call it, where they would diss one another. The whole family would be dissed. So every day he's teaching him how to put lines of poetry together. The moment he was able to do one, he dissed his own teacher. May Allah protect us from doing that. Right? We will stop there, inshallah ta'ala. I just want to thank uh, Sheikh Ahmed. What was your name, Sahih Sheikh? Ahmed. Uncle Ahmed. Right? And also because he's older than us in age, we call him Sheikh. Right? For facilitating this, this has been perhaps my most favorite program because it was a lesson. Right? Because we went through something that is substantial. Jazakum Allah khair to the masjid and everyone else that were involved. My brother Adam, who was coordinating with everyone else and our cameraman as well. Right? Inshallah ta'ala, thousands of people are going to benefit from it. So again, another big thank you to him. Right? Um, I'll see you guys when I see you. If we don't get together again in Arawa, I ask Allah to reunite us in the highest part of Al-Jannah, Jannah al-Firdaus al-A'la. Subhanak Allah bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha ila ant, astaghfiruka. وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته